I'm here. I'm here, everybody. Happy to see you all. The sun shining on me from my eastern window. I don't know about you. Okay. All right, let's go. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Lou. Okay, dearest people, happy to see you all. Your smiling faces for our weekend discussing, I mean, the course notes. I hope you've got all the course notes. I sent the course notes and I called it the psychology of Tantra, which is really the, a good way to put it, you know? I mean, we have so many weird ideas about these things and these, these terms are so ancient and we can easily mystify them, but it's extremely important to see that it's all about the mind. So we're going to be here together for these two days or as long as you last. Maybe you'll stay for an hour, that's okay. And so we're thinking we're going to listen and I'm going to talk, same motivation, about this information coming from our amazing holy beings, our spiritual mentors, our lamas, our knowledge holders, coming right back to the Buddha, this, different, this particular approach to Buddhist practice. Buddhist practice. Why are we listening to it? So we can take some tools from it. We can misunderstand that it's all tools to do what? To help us develop our amazing potential to become a Buddha, rid of all the rubbish, full of all the goodness, very simply, so that for our sake, and then so we can be of benefit to others for the sake of others. They talk about achieving the two purposes, achieving your own purpose and the purpose of others. Thinking like this. We're going to offer a mandala. Somebody is auspicious for this teaching. We offer a mandala from the group. A mandala, us, request, just requesting, offering a mandala to the Buddha, all the marvelous things of the world, requesting these teachings. It's auspicious to do that. Someone can lead it from the center. It's the students and the, the center requesting Buddha for the teachings. That's the way to think. And you just imagine all the marvelous things of the world, piling them all up and offering to the Buddha as a request. Sing it in English, it's okay, just say the words, doesn't matter, somebody. Okay, short mandala offering. This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Maru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. And there's a little mantra there somewhere. No, it's not there. Here it is. Say this one as well, Anna. Iram Guru Mandala Kanuriatayami. Okay, this is good. And now we have our refuge prayer. Somewhere there. There it is. Okay, good. This is good. So we say, to, I'll say it one time in English, a little bit extra words, so we get the meaning of what I'm saying. I'll say it two times in Tibetan. What's that crunchy sound? Is it okay? Did you hear that crunchy sound? Is it okay now? Okay. Okay. So now I'll say a little bit extra words. So we're saying, what we're saying here is that until we are enlightened, we're going to rely upon the Buddha, his teachings, and then the, the group of practitioners, our fellow practitioners. And that's the first point. And the second point is, and we're thinking by the virtuous karmic seeds we put into our mind just by listening to these teachings, may they ripen in the future, no matter how long it takes, as our Buddhahood. Why? So then we can be of perfect benefit to sentient beings. Sange chadang soke chognam la, jang chu badu dagni kyap suchi, dagi chon yen gi pe sonam ki, dro la penchir sange dro pa shok. Sange chadang soke chognam la, jang chu badu dagni kyap suchi, dagi chon yen gi pe sonam ki, dro la penchir sange dro pa shok. That's three times, once in English, twice in Tibetan. All right, everybody. <coughs> so saying the psychology of Tantra is really good because it reminds us, you know, it's not something is mystical and sort of different. And that, this is the first point I think to really make again and again and again, I try to make this point that, you know, in the world, the general idea we have there's you know, we've got body, we have a mind, which we think of as intelligent and, you know, and, and, and technically good. And then we have a thing we call a spirit, a third component, which is the Christian teaching, the, the Muslim teaching, most of the religious teachings that posit a creator. 
talk about a soul or a spirit, which by, which necessarily is mystical to us, you know, necessarily. But that's not the way Buddhism talks. This is the point. So saying that this is psychology, saying that Buddhism is psychology, first of all, it, you, we either think that we're insulting Buddhism by bringing it down to being ordinary psychology, or maybe the better view is we're lifting it up, lifting up psychology to realize that Buddha's teachings are about that. So what does psychology mean? Analyze. It's a Greek word. And I always point out, we love putting everything in Greek. As soon as it becomes a fancy thing or a mental illness, we put it in Greek. So don't ask me why, but it's very fascinating. But all it means is the mind. It's about the mind, about the mind, about the mind. And we can say the word psyche if we like. You know, it's a fancy word for the mind, maybe. But that's what Buddhism means by the mind. And that incorporates what we might mean by a spirit or a soul. But the Buddhist expertise is the mind. You can't say it's not. Because everything in the Buddhist teachings comes down to the mind. Consciousness, mind. So here, as we know very much, if we're studying Tibetan Buddhism, we're studying all the first level of teachings, which are the teachings you'd study and practice if you were in Burma or Thailand, known as the Theravadan teachings, or we might say the Hinayana teachings. Then you've got all the teachings you might study if you were in the Mahayana path in Japan. And then you've got all the final component of the of all the path, which is only in Tibet, coming from India, all came from India, but went, the, the Theravadan teachings went to Burma and Thailand. The Mahayana teachings as well went to places like Japan and Taiwan and China. But the, 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 the tantric teachings, the, the, the Vajrayana teachings, the most advanced level of Buddhist psychology only remains, seems to be intact, in, not even in Tibet, but in Tibetan Buddhism. Among the in the minds of Tibetans, so clearly it's not Tibetan in its nature. It came from India. You know the Tibetans had never heard of Buddhism until Padmasambhava brought it along there in the eighth century. And clearly it's not English or American either. That's something when I first heard the teachings. I remember when I first heard the teachings of Chen Raising Institute when I was thirty-two or something. The very first time I heard Lama Zopa Lama Yeshi teaching, it really was when it became clear to me that these things aren't cultural. They are cultural where they're being taught, but they're not in their nature cultural. I mean, then I realize if Buddhism were in its nature Tibetan, then clearly I don't qualify. I'm not a Tibetan. And clearly, you know, they can't just be cultural because if they were, then, you know, um, they wouldn't be adaptable. So when I really began to understand with karma and discussions about the mind that I first heard from Lama Zopa Lama Yeshi, that I realize that what we are is finally our mind, and that is not male or female or Tibetan or Australian or American or anything else. And that, in fact, our true potential is this idea of becoming a Buddha, which is a Sanskrit word, which I repeat repeatedly implies the person who's got that word, the person who's become a Buddha is a person who's eradicated all, all the delusions from their mind and has developed the perfection of, of the goodness in their mind. So it's all about the mind. And this is where you get used to the view, the, the idea of mind, meaning, all the thoughts, feelings, emotions, unconscious, subconscious, instinct, intuition, what you mean by soul or spirit, all these different words, the entire spectrum of our inner being is our mind. This is the Buddha's expertise. And it's coming from these genius Indians well before the Buddha, as we know. So that's what the word psychology means. So it's not insulting psychology, it's lifting psychology up, showing the Buddha is your best psychologist ever, you know? Your best therapist ever. It's not being sarcastic. So all of the teachings in the entire Lam Rim. Okay, when you, when you, again, when I first heard the teachings from Lama Zopa Rinpoche in this teaching at Chen Raising Institute in 1976 June, almost exactly. No, it's now July, so it's whatever many years ago. I remember. I always say this. I didn't know a word which I was talking about. I couldn't understand. I couldn't get a hold of it. I didn't know how to grab hold of what he was telling me. I couldn't hear much about the mind either. I heard all about, you know, I heard all about lower realms and I heard about refuge and I heard about, you know, all these practices. It was utterly confusing to me because obviously that packaging of the teachings, which we know as the Lam Rim, was presented for the minds of Tibetans. It, it was the way the Tibetans took the teachings from India and then packaged them for the minds of the being. So therefore the Tibetans, they understand it. It's a framework. But it took me a while. I kept saying to myself, where's the Buddhism? I couldn't understand. I had this vague notion of what I thought Buddhism was. I had no idea, obviously. But as you learn, listen to it more and more and more, you start to extract the essence from it. And what it comes down to 
finally, so I always like to say this, when it comes down to finally, you are actually being a Buddhist. You're doing the actual precise job of being a Buddhist. When you are lessening the delusions and growing the virtues, that's actually the point. Everything else in Buddhism, all the methods, all the philosophy, all the psychology, all the metaphysics, all the practices, all the mantras, all the prostrations, all the all those things that look like what we call Buddhism are all techniques and tools and methods that enable us to do that actual job of lessening delusions and growing the virtue until eventually you rid the mind utterly of all delusions and perfected the virtues. That's really the point. When we can see that, it all begins to fall into place, you know. So there are different levels of practice according to the capacity of the disciple, which is pretty reasonable. Math, music, you name it, is all exactly the same. Any body of knowledge that you're trying to learn to internalize, to, to, to internalize it, so you become a knowledge holder of that body of knowledge, it's taught at levels of your capacity. It's really obvious. Same here. So from that point of view, using the analogy you know the, the tibetans talk about the the, mid, the lower scope teachings Rinpoche says that's not really right he calls it accurately you know the teachings and practice are suitable to the disciple of the least capability and i cliche you know use the cliche junior school i just find that so helpful then you've got the next level the teachings and practice are suitable to the disciple of the middle capability and that's high school why not and then you've got the teachings and practices suitable to the to the disciple of the greatest capability and that's university. And then you've got postgraduate. Well, Tantra is postgraduate. Best way to put it. Now, that doesn't mean you can't also practice it. That's the difference here. You know, if you were practicing math, if you're just beginning on the first day when you're five years old with one plus one is two, you, you won't even be able to understand the, even the concept of multiplication or division. You do your addition first, you know, and then as you learn, but as you learn and you start to hear about multiplication, hear about division, you can start to, you know, go forward to create two math and get a bit excited and attempt to practice it. You can do that. But we know logically you won't experience the truth of grade two until you've experienced the truth of grade one. And this is exactly the same here. So we can, in one day, you know, if you're a Tibetan Buddhist, you've probably taken refuge. Then you would take your Bodhisattva vows, which is university. Then you would take your Tantric vows by having received an empowerment into one of the highest yoga Tantra practices. We go into these things roughly. So you're still a beginner in terms of experience. We haven't even mostly realized impermanence, which is what Buddha teaches, teaches us very first. We haven't realized impermanence yet. So that we can't possibly realize renunciation. If we haven't realized that, we can't realize emptiness. If we haven't got this, we can't realize bodhicitta. I mean, there's different stages, but you can practice them. So in one day, if you're a Tibetan Buddhist, you'd be, you know, you'd be, say, the first level is control your body and speech, abide by the laws of karma. You do that in one day. Then that's one tool in your toolkit. You'd control your body. You won't eat too many pieces of cake. You control your speech. You won't badmouth your sister. That's junior school. You can practice that. That might be the right method for you that day. Then, then, and then one hour later, you, you might practice forgiving somebody, having love instead of anger. That's practicing the compassion wing. And then another moment in the day, you say a mantra. That's university. That's from Tantra. So you, you're taking the tools from all these different levels of practice. Even though you haven't even realized junior school yet, you can do that. And it's good to do that. I mean, to have all these tools in your toolkit, to have taken refuge and Bodhisattva vows and the Tantric vows, have everything in your toolkit, you then have all the techniques that you can use that you need to actually get enlightened. So in fact, if you do all that in this life and then practice, you've got all the tools in your toolkit. Next life, you'll meet the Lamas again, you'll get more empowered and you'll keep moving you know so there's a long-term view to understand that we need to have now so there's one 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 approach another way to look at it is in terms of the buddha we see and i was i talk about this all the time so the buddha behind me which is a thai statue actually that's that's the form of the buddha that we learn about in the sutra you've got sutra and you have tantra it's one way of dividing all of the teachings into sutra and Tantra. So the Sutra teachings or what they call the general teachings, that's expressed by the Shakyamuni Buddha behind me. He gave these teachings 
in the, he gave these teachings with his mouth as an Indian person back in India two and a half thousand years ago. And that's known as the emanation body, the Nimanakaya. And mostly in sutra teachings, you'll only see about that one. Then you suddenly got, if you enter into Tibetan, and then if you're a Zen practitioner, you learn about that Buddha. If you're a Thai practitioner, you learn about that Buddha. You won't, you won't know all the other ones. You get confused if you see all these other ladies and gentlemen with four arms and seven legs and naked and looking weird. You know, that's, so I'm being silly, but hear my point. That's the expression. That's the manifestation of Buddha in the Mahayana path, but specifically in the tantric path, which is advanced levels of the Mahayana path. So they are known as the enjoyment body. And that form is the Bodhisattva style. They call it the Bodhisattva style. And then in there, there are thousands of different manifestations of Buddha mind. All, and it's all literally psychology. I'm not even being sarcastic. It's literally that. So for example, you know, we there are three essential qualities any Buddha has. One is compassion, one is wisdom. So one is the compassion, the wish to benefit others. One is the wisdom to know how, and then one is the power to do so, the ability to do so. So you could say that, for example, taking the Sambhogakaya form, the enjoyment body form, the subtle light body form, which we cannot see with our eyes, only when you've accessed our subtler mind and we've got some realizations, do we actually see the Buddha at that level? Then you can say that Chen Rezik, for example, compassionate eyed one, he's a manifestation of the compassion. So it's a, it's a visual language. That's really the best way to put it. It's a visual language, you know. You don't know that by looking. He's got these four hands, he's holding this, he's got an antelope skin over his left shoulder. You, you, you don't say, oh, look, there's compassion. No, you have to learn it first. This is obvious. Just like if you see the word compassion written in letters, but you don't know English. Well, in fact, you don't know Latin, or is it compassion, Greek or Latin? That's probably Latin. Then you learn the meaning, don't you? This is a really important point. You learn the meaning of those letters, all strung together, compassion, and you realize that you learn the meaning of it, what it represents. It represents a quality in the mind that when you see suffering, you reach out and think, oh my God, look at that suffering. That's called compassion. But you have to learn that, don't you? You don't see those letters and just know immediately, which is, of course, proving emptiness. So the same with that Buddha. Of course, it's a construct. It's a construct. Everything's a construct. Compassion is a construct. We make all these things up with our intellectual mind. So that form of the Buddha, peaceful aspect. Then you've got the wisdom. That's Manjushri, Manju, gentle voice, another form of the light body, the Sambhogakaya, enjoyment body, holding aloft a sword with fire on the tip. And he's cutting through ignorance, wisdom, manju, gentle voice. Jamyang in Tibetan. Then you got the power to put into action this com wise compassion. And that's often Vajrapani, a wrathful, fat, dark blue, wrathful Buddha, or Tara. They're a visual language that represent those qualities. So by practicing, and this is the one of the heart practices in the Vajrayana, which we're going to be describing, is the, the meditating on these particular Buddhas. And we can see we all do these without having an empowerment. And you can. You don't need to have received an empowerment or an initiation to do some of these practices. There's a certain level of Tara, Chen Rezig, Medicine Buddha. You can do these without having received empowerment. More advanced level of these you can't do until you've received empowerment. We'll discuss these different levels just briefly. But this is the essence of what I'm trying to get to, the experiential application of these practices. They're all, whether it's in sutra teachings where you control your body or you control your mind, and then the next level, practice compassion, and the next level, do these practices. They're all exactly for the same purpose. One, to help you lessen your delusions, and two, to help you grow your goodness. That's the bottom line all the way through from the most simple to the most advanced practices possible and they're if they're not for that purpose they're a load of rubbish chuck them out okay if they're just merely rituals if there's a single thing in tibetan buddhism if there's a excuse me if there's a single thing in buddhism that is is that is a val that is valid it is valid only because it is a doable practice to help you lessen delusions and grow goodness that's the bottom line if you were to think of it that way it's very it's a relief because it looks utterly confusing. Tibetan Buddhism looks utterly confusing. 
to us. We don't know wh where's the Buddhism. It's really true. It's what I first thought. Where's the Buddhism? Once we can begin to understand this, then this stuff fits into place. It puts we, we fit it into and we'll know then which tools we've got in our toolkit that we can use in any given moment in the day. You might want to control your body and speech, just like I said. Then you might want to control your mind. Then you might want to say a nice word. Then you might want to say a mantra. That's all taken from the toolkit from the from the first level of practice, junior school. Middle, low scope, middle scope, great scope, you know, and then finally postgraduate, as I call it, which is Vajrayana. They're all for the same purpose. But they're all according to your capacity. So it's really obvious if you haven't yet learned to control your body, which means you're not yet learned to not put your hand on the cake and shove it in your mouth because you're out of control, then you how can you control the attachment that drives your hand? It's really logical, isn't it? If you haven't got control over your speech, and the anger you feel just vomits out of your mouth. You first got to control the servant of the anger, the mouth. Then you've got the space to control the anger. That's an example of what tool you can apply at any given moment. It's really logical. It's logical if we think about it like this. And that's what's marvelous about all these techniques. We are able to access the more advanced practices by merely saying a mantra. If it's a mantra, it's from, it's from not all mantras. No, not all mantras are Vajrayana. That's for sure. You know, Shakyamuni Buddha is sutra aspect, and he's got a mantra. It's just a bunch of Sanskrit sounds that represent that energy. But the mantras we say like Chen raising, as soon as you say that, as soon as you see the light body, you know it's Tantra. Straight away, it's Tantra. As soon as you see the Sambhogakaya form, the light body form. That's Tantra, straight away. Vajrayana, Tantrayana, Mantrayana, they're all synonyms. Vajrayana, Tantrayana, Mantrayana. Yana meaning vehicle. They're all synonyms, referring to this as advanced level. Again, in the, you see, this is the interesting thing about the teachings. If you, I remember one time, you know, you go to a teaching among to the Tibetans, for example, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's teaching. And in the front row, you've got the 80 year old abbots who've been hearing these teachings since they were five years old. And then at the back row, you've got the five-year-olds who are hearing them for the first time. But the Dalai Lama, will, when he teaches the Lam Rim, for example, he won't teach it in some fancy esoteric way. He will teach it according to that level. But you will listen to it according to where you're at, won't you? If you've been hearing it for 75 years, you're going to hear it at the deepest level possible. The same simple words that His Holiness will say, same simple words straight from the mouth of the Buddha about impermanence. He doesn't make it fancy. If you've heard it for 75 years, you will hear it according to your level. And if you're five, you'll hear it according to your level. So this is why you can practice all of these according to your level. You might have taken in a high yoga empowerment. You haven't got a clue. As Lama, Zep Lama Yoshi says, Tantra is highly technical. It's incredibly sophisticated technology dealing with the subtler levels of our mind and our physical energy, highly sophisticated extraordinarily sophisticated technology. But you might have taken your highest yoga empowerment and you've got confidence in your lamas and you do the mantra every day and you do your sadhana every day, even though you haven't got a clue what you're doing. There's incredible benefit. You take it, you practice it according to your capacity. This is what's marvelous about all of these. You know, you don't wait. In other words, how can you possibly perfect grade one until you've really got grade two, because as you've done, you've done one plus one is two, you know it. But even as you learn grade two, that increases your ability to understand one plus one is two, doesn't it? So this is the same with the practices here. Every time you keep practicing, you're practicing all the levels. And every time you practice, it enhances all your understanding of all the levels. It becomes incredibly rich. And this is why you don't mind hearing the same teaching for the 75th year. You, you listen to it freshly every time. One woman recently said she'd heard the teachings and she loved them very much, but she said, Rubina, you keep saying the same thing. It's boring. I understand that. And that's a, that could be a problem because we're hearing it intellectually. Oh, I've heard that before. It's a bit like saying, well, I've heard that amazing piece of Bach one time. I'm bored now. Play me the next one. That means you haven't engaged in it at all. This is a major point, I tell you. So the teachings are taught at different levels, structured externally in different levels but we take them according to our capacity and we can apply all of them. We can take any of these tools and to have all these tools in our toolkit is marvelous, I tell you. So another way of talking about Vajrayana is just these different ways of presenting, okay? 
The other way is this is in terms of this, in terms of psychology, in terms of the, so if we look at the, in, if we look at um, in general, when we study the second scope of teachings and we study the high school level, we uh, learn about the mind, we learn low rig, we learn about the mind, we learn about the delusions, we learn about the virtues, we learn about the mechanical parts, we learn about the, the, the we learn about the, we learn about the contents of our mind. We learn the psychological model of the mind, which is amazing in Buddhism. The text we tend to use as a basis, which is from the monasteries from centuries now, is called Lorig, mind and awareness. So we're talking the psychological model. Now I said that's such a long sentence, I forget why I started it. Okay. So from that point of view, and this is taking the Four Noble Truths, this is the high school and junior school, which is the first scope, which is the Theriyana, Hinayana level, Theravadan level, which is the Four Noble Truths. Lord Buddha's first teaching, after he got enlightened, he walked from, you know, Bodhgaya, a few days, he went west, I think, we do that every year on our pilgrimage, we drive though, takes you about as long driving because the traffic's so bad. Anyway, we, we, he walked, no doubt, he didn't have a car at that time. He walked to Varanasi and he went to Sarnath to Deer Park and he met his old students and he gave his first teaching. So there he explained there is suffering. He explained there are causes, karma and delusions, which is exactly high school and junior school. He said there are there is the state called the cessation of suffering. In other words, you can get rid of suffering and its causes. And the fourth is how to do it. He presented this basically. Now, from that point of view, effectively, from the point of view of the, of the Hinayana teachings, which is the Four Noble Truths, effectively, attachment, and this is what Lama Zopa says this, is the main cause of our suffering. Now, we know if we've studied the mind, ego grasping, the root delusion, mat rigpa, ignorance, the subtlest one, the most pervasive, the hardest to identify, the misconception in the mind that grasps at an intrinsic me and intrinsic everything else. That is the root, but effectively the samsara that we live in, this desire realm, they call Buddha calls it a desire realm, meaning a realm of attachment. Meaning we've got a mind of attachment, we've got a body that's constructed by attachment from eons of practice, and then that has created the external world of the objects of attachment. Who do you, where do you think they came from? Not a creator. They are coming from our past karma. That we're so schizophrenic, we've separated ourselves from the universe. We've got this schizophrenic view, dualistic view of me and the world out there. And the world out there, by definition, are objects of attachment. Now, when you, we all know when you meet an object that isn't what your attachment wants, it's the object of aversion. And then you blame it and you get angry and so on and so forth. So now attachment effectively, this, this primordial emotional hunger, this instinctive, you know, the, vo the main voice of the separate dualistic me. I don't have enough. I am not enough. I do not want, you know, I don't have, and I'm therefore craving more, craving something. And what do you crave? The objects of the senses, the outside world. What else, you know? So this attachment, what I'm getting at is this. So at the very first level of teachings, the, the Theravadan level, the Hinayana level, the junior school and high school, all the teachings are framed in terms of controlling the attachment. First, junior school, you control the servants of attachment. You control the body and the speech, which do the, the wishes of attachment, and therefore the wishes of anger and the rest. First, you subdue this. This is an amazing level of practice. But effectively, it's implying attachment is the problem. Now you get to high school, middle scope, and now you start to study the mind. You start, you start low read. You, you start to study the, the components of your mind, the, the, the actual thoughts that are there, the concepts, the negative, neurotic, deluded concepts, the main one of which is attachment. Then you study the virtuous ones, the good ones. But in this essential level of practice, you're controlling the negative ones. You're harnessing the negative ones. Why? Because these cause you suffering. Why do you control your body and speech? Because harming others causes you suffering. This is the, the, the basis of all the first level of practice. So at this level, attachment is the poison. Attachment is the problem. We're trying to give up attachment. When you've got renunciation, which is the first level of realization, which is junior school and high school, when you've controlled your body, speech, and mind, when you've got renunciation, as Lama Zopa says, when you've got renunciation, just the thought of another moment of attachment. Just the thought of another moment of attachment is so disgusting, is so repulsive to you, so horrifying to you, that it's like being in a septic tank. 
then that's when you've got renunciation. So renunciation means you've totally understood attachment. You've seen the nightmare of attachment. You've seen the pain of attachment. You've seen the terrible suffering it causes you. This has got zero to do with guilt or blame or I'm a bad person. It's unbelievable compassion for yourself. That's how we'd put it. It's unbelievable compassion for yourself when you finally deeply have seen the pain and nightmare and suffering that this attachment causes you. As Lama Yeshi says, I can tell you about attachment for one whole year. We will never begin to understand it until we do this inner work. So during the renunciation level, which is junior school and high school, is really the retreat mode. The best way to do that is give, give up sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Give up the objects of attachment. Give yourself some freedom. Go the hell up to the mountains and go deep inside and unpack and unravel. And that's when you have renunciation. That's junior school and high school. So that's directly attacking the poison completely subduing the poison and what and by the way what would be the result of that you'd be joyful you'd be radiant you'd be blissful you've realized you've begun to realize your true nature you haven't realized emptiness yet you haven't got body cheating yet but already unbelievable that's the poison so the in terms of the causes of suffering you leave not only the attachment there but you leave the objects of attachment there because it's the poison, it destroys you. That's first level of practice. Now you go to the Bodhisattva path. Now you've subdued your body, speech, and mind to some degree that now you can go, oh my God, we're all in the same boat. And now you continue to work on your mind that never stops, that never stops from here to Buddhahood. But now you work on your mind at a different level, more powerful level. You continue to lessen delusions, but it's in reference to giving up self-cherishing which is putting me first, which is the consequence of attachment in order to break down the barriers between self and other. This is what you're doing here. You're working on your mind, but it's in reference now to others. The first level you're playing safe and you're leaving others alone. You're minding your own business. You leave them alone, back off, leave sentient beings alone and at least don't harm them. That's the first level. Now you've subdued your body, speech, and mind to some degree. You can begin to recognize we're all in the same boat. You've got some more courage now, more clarity, more wisdom. And now you can begin to, you work on your mind, you never stop. But now it's in reference to how to do what's best for others. And this is not possible if you haven't done the first components of the wisdom. Not possible, not possible. So you keep working on your mind, but now it's in reference to getting rid of self cherishing which is the consequence of having attachment. It's the attitude of putting me first. So we're trying to smash that and make this paradigm shift in the mind where now we eventually, when we've got bodhicitta, we put others first. This is amazing, again, psychological progression to eventually make this paradigm shift where you've got infinite love and infinite compassion and, you, it, and then it manifests finally as bodhicitta, where only others now are in the front of your mind. This is outrageous, amazing. So you, first of all, you're achieving your own purpose. You are a stunning, amazing, joyful, blissful, radiant person by now. But now also you've put some wisdom into this and you've got this incredible wish to benefit others and you've got the ability to do so because more and more you practice the wisdom, more and more it enables you to put, to put others first. So now you could say in relation to attachment, the main problem, you could say it's really radically less now and you can be more courageous. And even on the Bodhisattva path, as Rumate points out, you can now utilize this attachment. You can mitigate the attachment. You can lessen the attachment by being virtuous. The very first level, again, using the analogy of poison, you just leave the, the, the water, the poison in the water, okay, in that glass. You know it's got poison in it. You don't touch it. You leave it there. But as you progress and learn more and more about science or whatever the analogy here, learn more and more about the nature of that poison. And then you can add some good stuff to it in that you can add more water nature to the water that mitigates, that lessens the poison, can't you? You, you still, the poison's there, but the more good water, the more pure water you put in, the less effect the poison has. Well, that's the body suffer path. You add more love and more compassion and more body teacher and more good qualities. The attachment's still there. It's less. You haven't got rid of it yet, but it's definitely less. But it mitigates it and it and it enables you to still be having the attachment, but you put the goodness on top. The goodness is there and that underpins it. And then it lessens the attachment. It's still there, but this way you can even use attachment. Even on the body suffer path. What don't wait for tantra. This is logical. 
So you've got a relationship. You're a mother. If you're a maniac mother who's full of attachment to your little brand new baby, completely obsessive and attached, but you're deluded, you haven't seen your own mind, you don't know anything, you don't know the difference between love and attachment, and then your baby starts to cry and you beat it up. You've got no control. Your attachment's out of control. So your anger comes. That's a typical attachment. You think it's love. But now if you begin to practice love and patience and kindness in that relationship, you won't beat up the baby. You'll, and you'll know your crazy attachment's there, but you won't believe in it. You know your anger's there, but you'll subdue it because you're adding love on top. The first level is you just work on the attachment and the anger. This next level, by putting more virtue in the mix, you lessen, incidentally, you lessen the attachment, incidentally. So then you're learning to work with this attachment relation with your divine baby, but you're adding love and compassion and wisdom into the mix. So you're utilizing, in a sense, you're using attachment. Or for example, Lama Zopa says, at the time of death, for example, when the attachment, this unbelievable intense levels of attachment that kick in automatically at a certain level in the death process. It will catch us out of control, completely be shocking to us. A level of attachment that's so intense and that attachment is completely for this body, completely for this, uh, because we believe this is me. So we're clinging frantically. It's primordial, it's not conscious. But he says, you can use attachment. So when we understand attachment, and this is the point here, to even if we even at the body subtle level, if we don't understand attachment, if we don't understand how it's not love, and you learn that back in high school, if you don't know that, how can you even do what I said before, practicing love and compassion for your baby? You can't, you don't know the difference. So here at the time of death, Ramesha says, when we understand attachment has one function of holding on to something, doesn't it? You're grasping frantically at this me, at this body, desperate not to let go. But there's another function of attachment, which we, when we understand by studying it, that it looks forward to something. Attachment is always anticipating, always looking forward, always expecting. We live our lives in this, always looking forward to something. That's another function of attachment. Well, at the time of death, you can use that attachment, Rimache says. You can then stop clinging to this one, this old bag of bones that's about ready for death, but look forward to the pure lands, look forward to a nice, fresh little new human body. That's you, he says, you can't transform attachment when it's attachment to something here now, because you can't, it just doesn't work. But you can transform, you can use attachment to look forward to something useful. That makes it virtuous. So even at the Mahi, even at the body subtle level, you can utilize attachment, you can transform it, you can be wise and skillful. Now, the Vajrayana, the way we understand it, we've always heard, it's the classic one of actually literally, literally being able to utilize the energy of attachment. But crucially, which we'll discuss, utilizing the joy or the happiness or the bliss that is triggered by contact with an attachment object, you can utilize that literally as a tool on your path to enlightenment. It's the most sophisticated psychology. It's the most sophisticated mental methods, you know. So this is why even understanding this technically, studying it carefully, understanding these levels carefully, it can give us some kind of confidence in the path, you know. And that's why the lamas always use the analogy of a person, they call her an alchemist, or you can even talk about a, you can even talk about a horticulturist or a person who's good at botany. You first have to identify the weeds from the flowers. That's your first job. You've got to say there's a weed and there's a herb. You've got to know the difference. Weeds will destroy your garden and harm you, and the herbs will have, will you know the herbs will, will be medicine for you. But as you get advanced, learning more and more sophisticatedly, you can then find methods to use the the the, the, the weeds as medicine. We all know that. We understand that concept. It's exactly the same here psychologically. Now this is where it comes to you know. It can, we can practice methods in all these levels, but if you don't even understand what attachment is, this is why we must study it. If you don't understand theoretically, like botany, what are the characteristics of that poison, the weed, and what are the characteristics of a herb? If you don't understand that intellectually, if you don't understand intellectually even the theory of what is attachment, then how in the name of God in heaven, excuse me, speaking like a, an old Christian, how in the name of God in heaven can you ever, 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 ever even pretend to utilize it? It's a joke. 
you're being absurd and naive and arrogant if you think oh i'm practicing tantra i'm transforming attachment what's attachment oh i remember one person i remember discussing a very nice girl a very lovely person i know years ago very devoted to her vajra yogini practice and i heard her talking about attachment and i realized she, she was saying the wrong words i said tell me about attachment what is it and she said well i kind of know what it is but i can't say it and i said to tell me what's the answer one plus one is two what is one plus one and she said two i said you don't say well i kind of know the answer but i can't say it that means you don't know it okay but we confuse this is our big problem with buddhism we confuse liking it with knowing it this is the worst most arrogant mistake we can make really it's, it's quite shocking in fact you know because you like music does not mean you know music there's a massive difference it's good to like buddhism but if you don't learn to know it it'll run out and next life you won't care because you're not you're not growing it you know that's why holiness always tells us we must study the theories so you have to know ex if you want to dare to think that you can actually utilize attachment on the tantric path even utilizing it on the body such a path if you don't know what it is how the hell can you transform it it is literally 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 impossible it's like a joke so of course you know with the one of loving your baby mitigate which mitigates your attachment to your baby that you can begin to try and practice but you've got to know the difference if you don't know the difference between attachment and love you can't learn to grow love for your baby to counteract attachment because you think they're the same you think they're the same. I love my baby, but you just attach to it. You wouldn't know the difference. So you've got to begin to know the difference between attachment and love, for example. Fundamental. Then at the most advanced level, you listen to the tantric teachings. We can't understand it even. I mean, as Lama Zeshi says, it's highly technical because the most advanced levels of Tantra are to do with a person who's got single point of concentration, who's got incredible, powerful mind, who understands the subtler physical and mental energies. It's all about that. Transforming and utilizing and working with and controlling the subtler mental and physical energies. I mean, that's a joke. We talk about chakras and people go on about chakras and doing this to move your chakras and move the energies. We just, it's just cliched nonsense. Forgive me. It's like a joke, you know. It's high technology, highly technical, as I mean, yes, he says. But the principles of it we can understand, and the principles of it we can try. So at least if we don't have a clue about what it means, and as Lama Yeshi, as Lama Zopa says, you can take a tantric empowerment. Don't even pretend that you're going to get realizations this life. But with confidence in that path, with confidence in your gurus, with confidence in the system, and practicing every day, and doing your sadhana, and doing your mantras, and going through the stages theoretically, then you can develop some realizations eventually, you know. So before we go further, are there any questions about this general approach as I'm trying to show you? Are there any questions at all, specifically in relation to what I've said? T definitions, terminology, whatever you like. Are there any questions? Then we'll go into more things. Anything in there, Lou? Nothing? Or oh, Anna? Mary? Okay. Okay, darling. So this is the first way of just presenting concepts, you know, presenting concepts. So this is where the, the traditional way of teaching, of course, is that, you know, people, okay, people often say, well, am I qualified? Am I qualified to take a Tantra empowerment? Am I qualified to take a, a Tara empowerment? Am I qualified? Well, how do you find out? Just like if you want to enter a course in a university, you look up what the qualifications are, don't you? You just look up and you check the boxes. Am I qualified or not? Pretty straightforward. Well, you know, the qualifications here, certainly in, in our Galug tradition, Lama Sankapa's tradition, he talks about the qualifications are the three principal aspects of the path. In fact, what I think I want to do, I forgot to put it into the course notes, I'm so sorry. I might just get it up and I'll recite it, this beautiful prayer by Lama Tsongkhapa of the three principal aspects of the path. I might just say it today or tomorrow, we might just do that. I didn't, unless I send it all, I might put it, I might send it all to you, we can add it and we can all say it together. It's very wonderful. So the three, so the qualifications are you need to at least have some semblance of genuine confidence and some understanding theoretically, at least of the first of these three, which is renunciation. So this is a different way of presenting the lamb rim. 
The first and second scopes, junior school, high school, abiding by the laws of karma and working on your mind. This is the essence of this is renunciation, renouncing, you're renouncing suffering and its causes. Renunciation, recognizing what suffering is, the three levels, suffering of suffering. I'll go to the details now. I'll go into the three de details. So the, the re renunciation is the first one, which is the essence of junior school and high school of the Ramrim. The next of these three principal aspects of the path, of course, is bodhicitta, the, the essence of the compassion wing. And the third one is the, the third principle of the path is, is wisdom. Having a real, having an understanding of uh, at least a semblance of understanding of emptiness. Now, tech, this is an interesting point here, but this is an important point to realize as well. So now, in terms of in ter emptiness, understanding emptiness actually is a Theravadan teaching. It's a Hinayana teaching. You need the Hinayana Ahant, a person in Burma or Thailand who's on that path, you know, goes to high goes to junior school, controls their body, controls their speech, lives in vows, harnesses the body and speech. Then they go to the next level. We call it the middle scope. And they learn to work on their mind. They get renunciation. But then they would add to their practice the practice of shamatha, the practice of calm abiding. That actually is not even a Buddhist teaching. It's a Hindu teaching. Buddha took it along with him when he diverged in his own direction. So they would then practice shamatha. Of course, the Buddhists have got their own take on it. And they would get single point of concentration. And with that single point of concentration, they would then meditate on emptiness. And finally, the penny would drop in one life or other, and they would have a, a direct non-conceptual insight into emptiness, and they would keep practicing and perfecting and perfecting. And then in one life or other, they would have achieved their own cessation of suffering and its causes, which is the meaning of nirvana, hear this nirvana. And at that point, they cut the root of all suffering and they perfected their mind at this level. So when they die in that life, they will disappear into space. They won't come back. So Shamatha is actually even a Hindu teaching, but it's it's but it's but it's uh, and if you were on the Hinayana path, you would practice it there, and then you'd realize emptiness, which also is a Hinayana teaching, because you've got to realize emptiness to get out of samsara. So now for us, it's different in the Mahayana path, as we know in the Lamrim. This is important to, point to understand. We know very well that Shamatha and wisdom are the four, the fifth, and the sixth of the six perfections of the Bodhisattva. So in their character, they are Hinayana teachings, but they're taught in the framework of the final stages of, of your path to enlightenment. First, you get renunciation, the first, the, first, the first principle of the path. Then you get bodhicitta, the next one. And third, finally, on your path of perfecting the six perfections, you accomplish the fifth one, which is concentration. And then on, in the meditation, you get the sixth one, which is the realization of emptiness, but it's combined with bodhicitta. That's the unique way it's presented in the Mahayana path. It's combined with bodhicitta. It's taught in the framework of the Bodhisattva path, although in their character, they are Theravadan teachings. In their character, they are Hinayana teachings. It's important to understand that. And there's logical reasons for why Tsongkhapa did this or why they did this. In the, I think in the Lam Rim in general, the, I think, excuse me, I think all the Tibetans do it like that. Atisha must have done it like that. I'm not that good a scholar, I'm sorry. I think it's coming from all of them. So, okay. First principle of the path, aspect of the path, at least these are the three prerequisites for entering into Tantra. A prerequisite will be a, a genuine, a semblance of, but a genuine understanding of and an attempt to practice renunciation, first and second scopes. Then a genuine appreciation for and an attempt to practice bodhicitta, the, the middle scope, great scope. And then third, finally, a genuine appreciation of a semblance of understanding of emptiness. They're the three prerequisites. So if you've got these three to whatever degree, and, and as Lama Zopa would say, confidence and faith in your gurus and in the path, you are ready to take a tantric empowerment. That's the simple answer, you know. So of course we often would ask our teacher, am I qualified? And then often they say, well, it's up to you, you know. They're the three prerequisites. So really the typical way to teach Tantra first would be to teach these three, which is the essence of the Lam Rim, which in a sense is what I've just done before in an ad hoc kind of way, you know.
knowing it's obvious like it just if you want to enter into if you want to enter into physics at university you check the prerequisites i mean you'd been to junior school high school and you've got some level you know if you're not postgraduate physics you've got to have some level of junior school high school and, and and university don't you then you're qualified then you can enter in same here just the same just the same so of course if you've got actual realizations of these three then you're super qualified aren't you but we, we don't need to be super qualified mainly and really this is what Lama Zopa says they don't say this like this but you've got to have genuine confidence so look at confidence that word is faith really confidence confide with trust with faith which is not blind faith not just soup gooey faith it's grounded in intelligence grounded in your own common sense grounded in your practice you have confidence in the Buddha, confidence in this path, confidence in this map that you've got to enlightenment, and confident in the people in front of you, your knowledge holders, Rigsin, knowledge holders, your lamas, your gurus, heavy with qualities. I've heard that word means in Sanskrit. Or the word I love to use in English, a spiritual mentor, a person who's qualified and whom you trust, a qualified person whom you trust. That's a spiritual mentor. That's a nice word, mentor confidence in them and in the path they're the prerequisites you know they're the prerequisites so these days what's incredible and i really wish we could try, we could emphasize this more in our center donbrup i don't know how you're going to incorporate it into the into the spiritual you know recently for example his holiness the dalai lama gave haruka chakra zambara empowerment did you know that donbrup in general Okay, and he's giving others online now, which is astonishing, amazing, unbelievable, incredible kindness of his holiness to do this. So the other lamas are taking, taking that as a precedent, you know. So this is something that we don't need to have to travel to Dharamsala anymore. We don't need to have our lama come to our center anymore. Of course, we want that. But I think it's so marvelous, Dundrup. I wish I'm saying it in public to Dundrup so you can all request him. The summer we incorporate Dundrup into our spiritual program, this possibility of people getting Geshe to teach on the Bodhisattva vows, getting Geshe to teach on refuge, and then together as a group, we can, people who are qualified, we can all discuss, and, you know, we can, and then we can do the initiations together. We're missing these opportunities of His Holiness. Do you understand what I mean, Dundrup? We've got to discuss this and because it's a brand new way now. It's a brand, usually you'd have to go to Dharamsala. You have to invite the Lama to your center. Now they're allowing us, they're giving us this incredible opportunity. Of course, it's a generous times because people might go, oh, I think I'll do that. And they go it for a while and they give it up because there's no, and this is, this is the degenerate side of it. But if we can incorporate it to our program somehow, Dundrup, it will be incredible. I mean, we're missing these precious, precious opportunities. We just sit here passively waiting for somebody to come. Do you understand? But we can find the way in, we, in our wonderful structure that you know Dundrup's managing. We've got these different prerequisites all teaching. We've got them in our programs. We can teach the Bodhisattva vows. We can teach these different things. We can teach the three principles. And then we can enter together into these. I mean, I've done some of these me with some groups privately. I can't do it for the center because I'm, I'm not the boss, you know. I'd act like the boss, I realize, but I'm not the boss. I can't do it for the Septim Norby Ling, but I can do it like there's one group in Melbourne has asked me to do it, one of Lama Zopa's little study groups. So I'm going to do it with them. We'll do the Chen Raising initiation. I mean, that I can do because someone's requested me to do it. You know, we'll do it together with His Holiness. So special. And people say, people, many people say, just having it online with His Holiness, it's as if you're right there. So I think if you have faith in the Lamas, you will get the blessings, you know. It's such a precious opportunity, and it's tragic that we're not, not in my opinion, but it's, it's really sad that we're not, um, not just leaving it up to individuals, because they don't know what they're doing, but do it as part of our center and our education. Do you understand? So we can discuss more. I think it's so precious. You know? Anyway, that was an added little piece there. So I've, I've mentioned the three principles by just talking in this ad hoc way I've just talked getting some sense of the junior school and high school renouncing controlling your body controlling your speech which means this is the point now which means understanding karma don't just say the word karma what is karma karma is this word that refers to this law, natural law that runs the universe the natural law within which all sentient beings run that governs the happiness and suffering of all sentient beings a natural law this is the meaning of karma this is the beginning of renunciation you start to when you realize that you cause your own suffering then of course you want to give it up. That's renunciation. Renunciation means giving up something. What are you giving up? You're not giving up happiness. You're giving up suffering. Because you know that everything you think and do and say 
programs your mind, that produces your happiness or suffering. So it's a recognition of that. Then the next level is understanding the mind, which drives our body and speech to do actions. We understand attachment and aversion, these two fundamental ones, that the, the source of all the others, you know, they all kind of stem down to these two. that begins renunciation you're sick of suffering you're fed up with your suffering you're fed up with the depression you're fed up with the anger you're fed up with all the fears and the anxiety and the worries you're fed up with the anger you're fed up with the arrogance you're fed up with the low self-esteem and you're fed up with the sickness and the stuff that happened to you you take responsibility for it you are the source of this you own it it's a courageous view i tell you you start to become accountable when you start to understand karma not like a victim that's the beginning of renunciation. That's renunciation. Then the next one is you then, as I said, and this is a really important point, you move now to the bodhisattva path. And you don't stop working on your mind. That never changes from here to Buddhahood. But the emphasis is different. In the first level, what drives your practice at that level is the wish not to suffer in the future. It's all about you. You are the beneficiary. You've got to understand that. And I think we miss that hugely in the West. We just think of it as punishment and reward. We get all guilty. I'm a bad person. I shouldn't kill. No. But what drives your wish not to kill is because Buddha says, honey, child, that'll cause you terrible suffering. So if you know you don't want to be killed in the future, if you know you don't want to have a tendency to kill, if you know you don't want to get sick, then you want to stop killing now. If you know you don't want people to lie to you or be li or not believe your words, if you know you don't want to live in a shitty environment, you stop lying. Every one of these actions has their own consequences. And Buddha's telling us, honey, if you do these, they will bring terrible suffering to you. Like eating sugar, you get diabetes. You don't want diabetes, so, so give up the cause. That's the essence of the first level of practice, junior school and high school and renunciation. It's, and that means it's like what we call in the West, it's self-compassion. That really is literally what renunciation brings, self-compassion. Whereas not, renunciation sounds like a very forbidding word, doesn't it? And as Lama Zopa says, when we hear that Buddha tells us we need to give up attachment, we can because we conflate it, I'm saying this, with, with, with happiness, we go, oh, I've got to give up my heart. I've got to give up my happiness. This is the worst, grossest mistake we make when we, we don't understand what attachment is. We just think of giving up. We've got to be fundamentalist and not be happy and be miserable. Or I'm a good Buddhist. That's pathetic, you know. The consequence of giving up harming others and giving up attachment and anger is it your happiness that's implied is if it's if it's, a, if it's a method for giving up suffering flipping flip it over it's the method for getting happy we've got to remember that that's quite a revelation when we understand that practicing renunciation is your method for getting happy you're the beneficiary so you keep going to the compassion wing and you still do it for your sake i'll never forget when i first heard the teachings on bodhicitta from his holiness no, in general, hearing Lama Zopa teach, you know, he's a high holy being, was too much for my mind. I could not grasp onto it. I didn't, I couldn't find a way to get into these teachings. They seem too dramatic, too extreme, the levels of compassion the Buddha's teachings say that we can accomplish. But then I heard His Holiness say, if you want to help others, practice compassion. If you want to help yourself, practice compassion that gave me an insight into it and this is a really valid way the lamas talk first of all we think that sounds like it's selfish but you're missing the point if you think that when you realize that you stopping harming others is, is benefit to you and then you realize that you being compassionate to others is also benefit to you it's a very powerful thing to understand on the series of techniques in the series of 11 techniques that is the combination of the two methods of six causes and one effect and the other one of trans and, and trans, you know, and exchanging yourself for others is 11 techniques, a combination of both methods for getting bodhicitta. One of those steps is to see the disadvantages to you of being self centered, and then to see the advantages to you of thinking of others. Initially, we think, oh, that's selfish. Don't misunderstand. You've got to see that. That's a powerful drive. And of course, when you've got genuine love and compassion, of course it won't be for you, but you have to use this as a stepping stone. We miss this totally in the West. We hear these as very kind of heavy things against oneself. This is one of our worst mistakes, I think. Even a person I know who teaches Dharma and is a good teacher, truly thought that regret in the four opponent powers is I shouldn't have done that. I'm a bad person. This has got nothing to do with regret. Regret is renunciation. Regret is, oh my God, I can't believe that I've killed and stolen and lied. Look at the suffering it's going to cause me. I can't stand this. It's kindness to yourself. We love to be fundamentalists, you know. 
We love to hate ourselves. It's so terrible, it's so shocking. So when we practice the body's half path, you know, which I said, the very first level is renunciation, control your body and speech because you are sick of suffering. Now you continue to work on your mind that never stops. But the emphasis now is on what's better for other people. And that's how, these are expressed in the vows. There are three, three levels of practice, Hinayana, Sutrayana, Tantrayana. Or well, Hinayana as the first part of the Sutrayana, then the Paramitayana, sorry. The Hinayana, then the Paramitayana, which is the perfection vehicle. Hinayana and, and Paramitayana are both um, Sutra teachings, the general teachings. But one is the Hinayana approach, which is the, expressed in the lay person's vows. They're the vows of individual liberation, the vows that enable you to become liberated from samsara. The vows of not killing, not stealing, not lying, not this, not that. They, they're vows of playing safe, preventing you from future suffering. Then you've got the bodhisattva vows, which are more advanced, more marvelous, more amazing. And they express the bodhisattva approach. They're all about don't do this and don't do that, just like the earlier ones. But the reason behind them is to do what is best for others. The first lot is do what's best for oneself. Just don't kill. Just don't jump on the wrong partner. Just don't steal. You're the beneficiary. But of course, as Lama Zopa says, you are, the, you know, the direct beneficiary of the lay vows, the, 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 the uh, monk and nun and lay vows, the prati moksha vows, the individual liberation vows, the first level scope vows. The direct beneficiary is oneself. But as Lama Zopa says, all the rats and roaches will have a party because you stop killing them. So they're the indirect beneficiaries. But the purpose behind the Hindalana level, the purpose behind the Prati Moksha, the purpose behind the lay and, and monk and nun vows is you not having future suffering. Now you harness your body, speech, and mind to some degree, and now you move to the body suffer path, and you continue to work on your mind, as I keep saying, but now it's in reference to attempting to do what's best for others now. That's the point of all the body suffer vows. So all the bodies have a vows, and we should talk about all these are the three, these are the three principles. These are what prepare us psychologically for understanding Tantra, you know. So the bodies have the lay vows are five. Monk and nun vows, you know, the boys have got 250 and we got like 360. The girls got more. That's how it was in India. What can you say? Then the bodies have vows, you got 18, I always forget, 16, 14, 18. What is it, Dundra? How many root vows in Bodhisattva? 16 or 18, I can't remember. We have Bodhisattva vows, the root vows, the main ones, you know, like, um, you know, you like, you know, the, the main, the main, well, let's just get the vows and we'll go through. This is part of the, pro, this is all part of the three prerequisites, right? Let's just look at them, we'll get them out there. Hang on a tick, I'll find them. Course notes, no, no, practices, prayers, here we go. Prayers and, okay. Here we go, docs for all people, bodhisattva, here we go. Ah, oh, there, here we go, bodhisattva there. So let's just go through them roughly, just a bit, so you get the general idea, you know. I'm sure some of you received these documents from me, you know, the, with the, related to the ray, the refuse, lay vows, and also the bodhisattva vows. So we'll have a look at one of these. Here we go. Okay, let's go. So the lay vows are don't kill. For example, don't kill. Just don't kill. There's no regal room. Or can I kill if it's for their sake? Not yet. No. That's the bodhisattva level. So this is the other way of describing the difference between the lay vows, the body, the prati moksha vows, which are monk and nun vows and lay vows, and the bodhisattva. The, 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 in the, in the, in the, the main emphasis in the prati moksha is on the action. Just don't do the action. Just don't lie. The bodhisattva is more nuanced. It's the motivation that determines whether or not you break it. That's the major difference. So let's just look at a couple of the bodhisattva vows, okay, just to give the idea. Just to give the idea. So you've got 18 root bodhisattva vows and 46 secondary bodhisattva vows. 140. Let's go. Here we go. So some of the, the root vows, for example. Where are they? Now I've lost them. What is this? Okay. One. What is this? Oh, I've lost it. Oh, it's oh, here we go. 
for example, a Bodhisattva bear would be, you know, <clears throat> uh, number four. No, no, let's keep it simple. Refusing others' apology. I mean, for example, or number two, let's say. Number, even number one. This was the first one. Look at it. Praising others and belittling, praising oneself and belittling others. Now that's called a Bodhisattva bear. So, you know, you give up. So, uh, you know, thinking you're so important. And in other words, this is a very powerful one because we can see automatically the sense of I, the ego, cause us to always see our qualities. And then we love to point out other people's qualities. We love to do that, you know, it's just automatic, even if we think we're a nice person. So it's a first vow, root vow. So the key thing about, this is where you get the motive. This is where Alex Burzen is given in this commentary. I've got Alex Burzen here. I have to look for this. He, he's very clear in listing each vow, listing which particular delusion determines that you break it or not. This is the point about, this is the difference between the, 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 lay, the, the, the Prati Moksha and the Bodhisattva. Here it is, the 18 root vows. Here we go, page 68. Burzen is very clear for us Westerners, 68. So for example, for example, well, actually he's helpful. Burzen says, he tells what a vow is. He says, a vow is a subtle, this is interesting, a subtle invisible form on a, on a mind which shapes our behavior. It's a very sweet way of putting it, you know? It's a restraint from something. A vow in general is a decision to refrain from something. It's a powerful mental decision to not do something. And in general, all vows are connected. This happened, something's running out of power here. I've got to plug in something. Wait. Trackpad. Okay. So in general, you know, the, the vows are behavior. They're all about, they're not about the mind, they're about body and speech. And they shape our behavior, which is a really sweet way to put it, but it's sort of fairly obvious. If you decide, you know, and I always make this example, if you are driving a car, you're making these powerful decisions, are you not, to not turn the wheel left if you want to turn right, to not put the foot on the accelerator if you put on the brake, to not do this, to not do that. You learn these and you, learn, and just, you, are, you are shaping your behavior. It's a very sweet way to put it, but it's literally what you're doing. In other words, there's nothing special. We live in vows all day. We know thousands of vows. This is how we behave. It's how we learn to know what to do. You pick up your fork this way. You pick up your knife that way. We learn behavior. All that a vow is, is that. So what are you trying to shape your mind into? The mind of a Buddha, not the mind of a driver, you know? So, okay. A root downfall means a loss of the entire set of the bodhisattva vows. If you break the one of the main ones, you break the lot at the root. So now the first one, praising ourselves or belittling others. Now, please, if you've got bodhisattva vows, some of you people want to get your bodhisattva vows, and you do this, check the last time you did it, and we do it all the time. So subtly, we're so sneaky, you know, praising yourself, putting yourself up, and putting others down. You think about it. So this refers to speaking such words to someone. So this is mainly speaking to someone who's in, this is you, it's, it's precise. He gives it precise in an inferior, to, speaking this to someone who's an inferior position. So this is where he says the motivation must contain attachment for profit or praise or love or respect. That's the motivation for this one. So this is where you're really drilling down. In the first Prati Moksha, you just don't kill. You just don't kill. You don't lie. You don't steal. Here it's more nuanced. It demands more awareness of your mind and determined by the motivation, which implies, which is the point of Bodhisattva vows, that you can do one of these actions if it is for the benefit of the person in front of you. This is already where you can see literally how the Bodhisattva path is utilizing delusions. You know, if you're a kind, good mother, and you've told your child five times, do that, and they haven't done it. You must use firm methods. They will think you're being angry, but you know you're not being angry. Your motivation is truly compassion. That's already telling us that even on the, on the Mahayana path, the Bodhisattva level, the Sutra teachings, we can utilize anger. It's obvious. The first level is you just don't say bad words. Here, you're allowed to say bad words. 
if your motivation is compassion. So you can't play with this. You can't pretend. Just to hear the vow is you break this vow. If you're speaking to a person who's a lower position, like you're, 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 you know, like a, if you're a monk and you're speaking to a monk who's got less ordination, or you're a teacher and you're speaking to somebody, or you're, you're a mother talking to your child. I mean, this is very powerful. Just as something as simple as that. We do it so often. The next one, this is a not sharing your dharma or not sharing your wealth. It's a bodhisattva vow. And the motivation would be specifically attachment and miserliness. Now, this is where, you know, for example, you see a person who's asking you, let's say it's your sister, she's always borrowing money. She's wasting money. She's abusive of money and she's borrowing money all the time. It is completely appropriate with a pure motivation of genuine kindness to your sister to say, no, I won't give you money. That's valid, but you don't just do it. You don't pretend you're being generous. You do it, you don't, you don't pretend you're not, you know, that you, you're being, you just, if you're just doing it from being mean, you've got to be clear in your mind. This is why the bodhisattva vows are more powerful because it already demands more awareness of your mind, you know. Not listening to others' apologies or hitting somebody. So, if, you know, you heard, so the motivation for either of these must be anger. You know, so if you not listen, so someone, you've, someone's harmed you, you know, let's say someone, um, Oh. So listen, the first one refers to an actual occasion when yelling at or beating someone and either that person pleads for forgiveness and you don't give it. I don't know if you go around beating too many people, do you? I hope not. Or if, if your sister's been mean to you and you won't forgive her. That's a, that's a bodhisattva vow. It's a root bodhisattva vow. So that's why you've got to study these. You can't just say, oh, yes, I've got, I've, got 52, I've got 52 things that I have to learn to drive a car, but you never read them. It's a joke. You've got to read them and know them. So you've got to read these. You want to take these bodies up the vows. Come on, you people. Things like that. So the motivation here, the general point is, in the first one, it's just the behavior. Just don't do it. Control your body, control your speech. And, if, and now we get to the body suffer level and we start to still not do this and not do that, but it's in reference. It's based on motivation. It's in reference to not wanting to harm. Still, it's still that. But it's also in reference to what's better for the other person what's best for the other person as well. All the bodhisattva vows, there's 46 of them, they're all divided up into helping you understand each of the six perfections. A group of them are related to generosity. Then another group are related to the practice of morality. Another group are related to the practice of the, in each of the six perfections. They're really nicely structured, you know? So in relation to, this is the 46 second root, this is the 18 root. So the, for example, in relation to generosity, there is a vow. Let me just find it. it one of the, 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 the uh, one of the forty-six secondary vows. Hopkins, Jeffrey uh, Alex Burson calls them something different. He has a different term. He's got his own translation style. The forty-six secondary bodies have to vow. So one of them. So in relation to generosity, for example. So he calls them faulty actions. There are, there are seven related to generosity. So seven faulty actions or secondary vows detrimental to training in generosity. So not making offerings to the triple gem with your body, speech, and mind. That breaks the body sattva vow. Following your own, this is really, this is hilarious, this one. You listen to this one, people. This is a secondary body sattva vow. Is like because of so much attachment or lack of contentment, indulging in any of the five types of desirable sensory objects. I mean, it sounds very depressing. Just out of, because we're, we're bored. I mean, attachment means we're bored. We've got dissatisfaction. We're never satisfied. We always want something more. So we just, you know, for example, this is we go to the fridge and you see the delicious cake. You just nibble at it and take a piece of cake mindlessly. Everybody does that. We've taken it really seriously. You're following attachment. You're breaking a, a, a secondary body type of vow because what it does is make you mean. Because if you get so attached to that cake, then you know that a friend is coming. So you put the cake in the back of the fridge in case they get it. Naturally, it brings a lack of wanting, not wanting to share it with others because we're always dissatisfied. So, I mean, these practices are so profound, but they really are quite technical. And they really will give you incredible insight and instructions if you drill down and read them and understand them. Not showing respect to our elders. This is detrimental to... Um, there's different kinds of generosity. They talk about the generosity of giving things, the generosity of giving advice, and the generosity of giving protection. They call it that. 
So there's different vows. They're very specific and they're all based on different motivations. It's very helpful. So just delicious to read the commentaries. Okay. So this is the second level of vows, the body sattva vows. So for example, one of the vows in relation to generosity, let's say, you know, let's say Anna rings me up and says, Rabina, would you like to come for dinner? And I just can't be bothered. I'm bored, like we all are. I'm comfortable watching my television. Oh, I'm so busy, Anna. First of all, you lie anyway. But second, I just broke a bodhisattva vow because I prevented Anna from creating generosity by offering me a meal. So this shows your motivation has to be clear. In other words, if you really can't go tonight, you've got other things to do, you sincerely apologize and your motivation is pure for saying, no, Anna, I can't come. But if you can come, then you've got a vow because you're allowing Anna to create the virtue of practicing generosity. You don't say, oh, Anna, I'm doing it for your sake. No, that's patronizing. So you've really got to see your mind. And we know that most of the time, we say yes or no to an invitation is based solely on our attachment. We think we're so holy. So this really, these vows demand you go deeper in. These are a prerequisite for practicing tantra people. Bodhicitta, it's an emptiness, is the energy that enables you to really do the technicality of realizing things. But bodhicitta is what drives the bodhisattvas to want to practice tantra. This is why in the Gelug, in our tradition, Tsongkhapa puts the shamatha and emptiness at the end. Because if you start practicing those back where they belong in the Hinayana level, when you get realizations of emptiness, you can't even just shamatha, you can't realize the levels of bliss that you will accomplish. It's inconceivable levels of bliss. Well, if you get so much bliss, forget about sentient beings, I'm sorry. So it's really wise that these are put at the end of the Bodhisattva path because what drives the Bodhisattva to even want to practice the, the six perfections is Bodhicitta. Without that, you're lost. It's very, it's very, it's very sensible. Bodhicitta is what drives you to want to practice Tantra. Emptiness gives you the ability, you think that way, but this is what drives you to want because you can't bear the thought of all the suffering sentient beings. This is what they all say about the great yogis. And why, for example, I mean, you use the example of Lama Zoe because he's somebody I know, you know? The thought for Rimache of sleep, for example, is, uh, is, so, is like so disgusting. It's like, it's like, it's so disgusting. Sleep is a disgusting waste of time. That's what Venerable Roger says about Rimache. He literally not wastes one second. And what drives it, you see, yogis like this, great tantric yogis, they're all tantric yogis, these people. They don't need sleep because they have complete control over their subtle energies. But what drives them to not want to sleep is their unbearable compassion for the unbearable suffering of all sentient beings. It's like going to sleep while your child is dying in agony. You can't, this is genuine for these beings, you know, they, the thought of sleep. So you know, you've got someone like His Holiness who looks like a regular person. He goes to bed at eight o'clock, gets up at three. He's not sleeping, people. Don't, don't be fooled. He's a great tantric yogi. They don't need sleep. They're practicing 24 hours a day in their levels of their mind that they can accomplish. But it's, what, it's compassion that drives them. It's compassion that makes you want to practice tantra. So when we hear that, it's very humbling. Who's got compassion that level? Forget it. You know, We want to practice tantra because it's quicker. It's just totally gross self-centeredness. They practice it because it's quicker, so you get enlightened quicker. In other words, if you've got your child is dying and there's some medicine a thousand miles away, sure, you can walk. And the fact is a bodhisattva, they would walk if they had to. They would crawl on their hands and knees if they had to, 1,000 miles to get that medicine. But for God's sake, if they could get an aeroplane, would they not do it? So we only want to go quicker because it's easier. They want to go quicker because it's better for the child. But they would walk if they had to. They could crawl backwards if they had to. That's the enthusiasm of Bodhisattva. But the reason to go quicker is because then you can help sentient beings quicker. This is the Bodhisattva. And these yogis are Bodhisattvas. And this is the Bodhisattva vows that express, that unpack these attitudes that we're growing, that we're shaping our mind into. Okay. Yeah, not the Bodhisattva vow, like I just said, 
not accepting when invited as a guest. If we refuse to go for a visit or a meal because of pride, anger, he gives all the delusions, pride, anger, spite, laziness, or indifference. We deprive the other person of an opportunity for creating merit. You break a vow. So this is a, a, a real eye opener. We do this all the time. You know? We do whatever suits us. If, you're bo if I'm bored that night, I will rush to Anna's dinner. But if I'm full of, I've got my boyfriend over, you know, this is what happens when you have a boyfriend, you suddenly fall in love with somebody, your friends don't see you for dust because you're so attached. Oh, I'm so busy with my boyfriend. Nobody would argue with that. Can you imagine you're in love with your boyfriend and Anna rings and asks you for a meal? And you say yes, and rather go to have a meal with Anna and not be with your boyfriend. People think you're insane, but that's what a bodhisattva would do. We just totally, we do everything based, oh, of course I can't go, Anna, I've got my boyfriend here. We say that as logic. It's just following attachment. We're too much, you know. Not giving teachings. If you're qualified to give any kind of advice, by not giving that advice, you break a bodhisattva vow. Just giving examples, okay, of the approach of the bodhisattva vow. It's more nuanced. Rooted, it's based on motivation, and it's more to do with what's best for the other person. The first lot are what's best for you. Play safe. Don't create future suffering. So it shows us levels and levels. It's logical. It's levels of capacity, levels of psychological capacity. That's what it means, you know. Okay, this is an interesting one. You break a body type of vow. If you don't do something negative, if you don't do something negative out of love and compassion, Occasionally, certain extreme situations arise in which the welfare of others is seriously jeopardized and there is no alternative but to prevent a tragedy other than committing one of the seven destructive physical or verbal actions. In other words, you're allowed to lie, kill, steal, cheat on a partner if it is preventing suffering to another. This is heavy duty. You have to understand this really carefully and have enough wisdom. You can't play with these things. And most of us don't have this wisdom. That's why there's an example. I always give this example of Lama Yeshi. I always tell this story. You've heard me tell it, I'm sure. Years and years and years ago at Kopan, probably in the 80s, early 80s, late 70s, one of the Sherpa monks was very sick. This is a similar, this is a type of thing, similar example. And Harry had found a, Harry with this monk, this American fellow, he'd found a doctor and he told Lama Yeshi that he'd found a doctor to help the monk. And Lama basically said, he doesn't need a doctor, it's okay. So Harry, trusting Lama Yeshi's wisdom, didn't get a doctor. Well, Harry observed the monk was getting sicker and sicker. And eventually the monk went back up to his family up in the mountains and he died. Now that sounds like Lama Yeshi was cruel, isn't it? It's clear. He can easily be criticized for that. I mean, I just read now, it's very heavy in Australia, an entire group of a small religion who don't believe in taking, doing medicine, they believe in God's blessings. They allowed, they supposedly allowed one child to die. But their motivation was clearly pure because they have faith in God. They've all been accused of murder because they didn't do something to prevent the death of this child, according to the Western views, you know. This is the same here. So what's all that about? Well, Lama Lundrup, the abbot, told Harry, well, of course, one, Lama's got clairvoyance. And this is why you get clairvoyance even when you just get shamatha. We've had clairvoyance in countless lifetimes. This is nothing special, but you haven't used it, that subtle mind to get emptiness. So we've lost the plot. So clairvoyance is an ability to see beyond the grosser level, to see the past, to see the future, to see the mind of another. So clearly Lama had bodhicitta, uh, 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 clairvoyance. Obviously Lama has got bodhicitta and therefore realization of emptiness, all these three. He's accomplished these three. So then as Lama Lundup said to Harry, well, clearly Lama could see the mind exactly of this monk. He could see exactly the negative karma he created in whichever life it was in the past. He could see clearly that if the monk had got a doctor, he would have gotten better and had a fine life. But he would not have purified this heavy karma from the past and his next life would be much, much worse. So Lama could see that and therefore made the decision better for the monk. He got taken care of. He had a very good death. He got taken care of. And that experience purified all the karma of that particular action. And next life was fantastic. 
Yeah, who's got that kind of wisdom? We do not have it. So we can't play with this, you know. But in this case, as it's true, it's literally a bodhisattva vow. So for example, you know, these seven are taking, you can kill, steal, jump on the wrong partner, lie, speak divisively, use harsh language, or rev it on. These are the seven non-virtues of the body and the speech. So he, this is a powerful concept, but you have you are you would do one of these based solely on a purest motivation, knowing it would bring benefit. That kind of wisdom we mostly don't have. So we don't play, you know, we don't play with it, like with Lama, you know. We don't play with it. But in a, in a small that's like calling like a white lie. You know, but it's got, we, we, we love to lie because we're protecting ourselves mostly. But if you can see sincerely that lying to that person is beneficial to their mind, then you would do that without a doubt, based on a pure motivation, not as instinctively, but you would do it with a pure conscious motivation. Now to kill for this reason, that's pretty heavy duty, isn't it? Can't think of that one. That's why we don't. That's why if we don't understand these bodhisattva teachings, and if we don't realize that this is a level of wisdom that you can cultivate, then the world doesn't make sense to us. Then we hear about bodhisattvas who harm others. It just doesn't make sense to us. That's why I always saw that story about that. You know, bodhisattvas. They see the bodhisattvas, these fierce, devoted, determined, great bodhisattvas. Who me? Most of whom are also yogis. They're all tantric yogis. It comes together, and certainly in the Tibetan path. If you're a bodhisattva, you're a yogi. If you're a yogi, you're a bodhisattva. You know, it's just these two are so totally integrated, coming from this path that we are learning that we are on from the Tibetans. The bodhisattvas go from life to life to life connecting with sentient beings as one of their jobs is to hook sentient beings you need a karmic connection with somebody in order to even meet them again and they want to meet sentient beings again and again in order to lead them to enlightenment when they're ready so this bodhisattva is a famous story when my mother first met lama yeshi and she freaked out about him she thought he was awful that yeshi she'd go on about it you know it doesn't matter the reason and i was nervous oh god she's criticizing a buddha blah 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 so i heard this lovely story about this one bodhisattva and you can't tell who are bodhisattvas tibetans say you can't see who anybody is so don't judge but this dude these bodhisattvas don't walk around with halos so in, there he was he went to some village and he's hooked everybody he's connected so the best way to help people is with peaceful methods this is from tantra another way to help is with wrathful methods another way to help is with controlling methods where you're utilizing the delusions so he was peaceful. All the all the people he hooked them. He made a karmic connection, which means in thirty-seven lifetimes he will meet them again, and when they're ready, he will lead them to enlightenment. But this one particular old lady didn't notice him, and he couldn't leave her behind. He had to make a karmic connection. Peaceful methods didn't work. So he discovered he had a beautiful garden, and he rode his horse through her garden, destroying it. Now she noticed him, and he was so happy. He got her. He hooked her. Now, if you'd been there, I'm sorry, you would not see some nice fellow winking at you. I'm really a bodhisattva and I'm trying to hook this lady. I'm going to run over her garden. You would have seen a dude running over her garden being mean and ugly. And you'd just see a mean, ugly guy. But he was a bodhisattva. His method, his motivation was to get her. And she was shouting and yelling and shaking her fist. And probably all the rest of the village threw him out as well. He didn't care. He got her. So as the Lama who told that story said, when it comes to making a connection with bodhisattvas, it's better to have a bad connection, meaning she shouted at him, than to have none. Just this aspect alone of the bodhisattva path expressed in the vows, this whole approach is radically different from the very first level of just being nice. We really need, if we don't understand this, then the bodhisattva path makes no sense whatsoever, you know? time is it 10 11 it's time for a break i think isn't it don't who's the boss here who's uh, hannah anna what's break time is now right no? and break time is scheduled for half an hour's time vulnerable but it's it's up to you and then what time are we coming back um we are we were scheduled for a break for an hour and a half for lunch okay i think I think we break now. I think unless there's some questions or you want to think about it and ask me questions after. Well, we can have questions now if you'd like. If you have any questions now, let me know. But my feeling is, I, mean, I haven't stopped talking for 90 minutes, have I? So that's okay. Pretty intense. I think I'd like to break, leave a break now.
and, and write down your questions if you have them. And we'll be back in 90 minutes. Is that okay, everybody? Back in 90 minutes, a bit earlier than before, but I think 90 minutes is enough now. So it's now 11.30 in Santa Fe, so one o'clock. One o'clock, in an hour and a half, we meet again on the hour, okay? Everyone, is that okay? So think about everything I'm saying, and all oh, this is a prerequisite for being ready for Tantra, people, okay? Buddha there, there's Vajradhara. You can see him a little bit. Vajradhara is the tantric aspect of Buddha. Okay, so talk to me. Are there questions? I really want quest questions from everybody from what we've discussed so far. We have a question in chat, Venerable. Good. It starts, I would like to hear more about what is the dualistic mind and how it causes us trouble. And okay, there's good. a specific question that follows. Could you tell us more about attachment? How do we learn to recognize it and use it? Or any suggestions regarding Okay. Book? Well, the first is to recognize it so we can stop it. This is the interesting point. We can't, it's sort of like, like I said, you know, we're just learning to learn botany and we've got to distinguish between herbs and weeds. And we have to identify a herb, a weed, and know how it causes suffering and know how it's poison. Then as we get more advanced, as we learn more and more and more to understand it, we can then learn to use it and transform it. That's why it's so advanced. So, yes, the first step is to recognize attachment. And so attachment is the main voice of this, uh, of this big mistake, this big sense of a separate self. One way of describing the main problem, as far as Buddhist psychology is concerned, is this primordially deep, hugely primordially deep misconception. They're all basically misconceptions that posits instinctively the separate a sense of a self a concrete solid set in stone sense of a self and one aspect of that which sounds pretty cosmic to us is that as they say dualistic meaning there's me and then there's you in other words the, the very positing of this concrete sense of a separate self implies others so it sounds pretty, that sounds very, very mystical to us, because if we look at the ordinary world and we think about daily life, we can see very vividly the world is made up of billions and billions of separate individual people. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? So to hear that that itself is a mistake sounds really too weird. There's no view like this in psychology, you know. So the way to talk about that would be that if you had got all the realizations, if you have done the job that Buddha says we can do by going through these stages of practice, the first being subduing the servants of this crazy dualistic eye and not killing and not stealing and not lying and not you know, putting too much cake in the mouth and all the rest, which is driven by this main voice of this dualistic eye, which is this bottomless pit of craving, this bottomless pit of I am not enough, I don't have enough, which is called attachment. The more we learn to subdue the servants of that attachment, so then the consequence of that is we learn to become more subdued, we have more control, and then we get to the next level of practice where we now begin to really identify the attachment and the anger and the other delusions that drive this crazy sense of self. So the consequence of this level of practice, just this level of practice alone, is to become more stable, more fulfilled, less feeling of separateness, less feeling of being bereft and lonely and cut off, cut off and nothing and nobody and I'm nothing and nobody. That's the energy. That's how we experience this way that ego works. So as we lessen the delusions and lessen and control the deluded behavior, already we're beginning to heal ourselves, if you like. And one way of saying that is we become less separate, less cut off, and more connected to others. I mean, this is just talking experientially. I mean, we know very well if you wake up one day and you're really depressed or really angry or really jealous or really self-esteem, so low self-esteem or really arrogant or really emotionally hungry, there's this vivid feeling of the poor me here and this whole horrible world out there, you know, so separate. Look at suffering human beings. So as we lessen that, as we start to do this first level of practice, we become more fulfilled, we become more content, and just naturally we become more expansive and more connected to others. So this process, and as you keep going on that process of continuing to grow yourself, continuing to lessen delusions, continuing to grow your goodness, and then on the body subtle path, continue to grow your goodness, and you eventually cut that neurotic sense of self by realizing emptiness, now you have this amazing, joyful, vast, extraordinary, compassionate, empathetic, connected 
person. It's just a way of talking very colloquially. This is the experiential result of this practice. So then we can begin to really realize how this positing of the separate, poor, lonely, bereft, concrete me is a complete fabrication. We've made it up. And Buddha says we've been believing in this for eons, but we believe in it totally. This is the kind of the, the background to it. So we need to learn then to recognize these components of this ridiculous I, this emotional hunger, the starting point of this connect, disconnected separate sense of self. The main voice of this separate sense of self is this emotional hunger. I do not have enough. I am not enough. Never content, never fulfilled, never enough, never enough, never enough. We know that. We recognize that. That's the energy of attachment. And then that means we're always hungry to get something more, to get an object of the senses, which is the most obvious level, or to get approval by others or people to love us and praise us and stroke us and tell us we're nice people, to always get something more. And the utter belief of that attachment is when I get that something, when I get that praise, when I get that object, I will somehow be more fulfilled. But in Buddha's telling us it's a real misconception, and this really takes time to identify, because the more we follow attachment, as my mother used to say as I was a little girl, and I'd think about it, the more you get the more you want. So the attachment mind really is the mind of a junkie. It's the dissatisfied mind that believes totally when I get that alcohol, when I get that new boyfriend, when I get that new handbag, I will then get happy. But the Buddha says when you start to investigate it, and this is what takes time, you will discover that you're not getting more happy, you're getting more unhappy because it's not feasible, it's not viable, it's not realistic because cakes and bodies and handbags can't make you happy. It's the mind that makes us happy. And in fact, it's the giving up of this attachment that brings us contentment and joy and fulfillment. There's just casual words for it, you know. So we need to learn the technicalities. We need to learn what attachment is, what is ego grasping, and how they function. And then you put meat on the bones from your own daily experience. And then eventually you can learn to, to, to work with this energy as the, at the most advanced level. That's the general answer. Any other questions there, Anna? We have Mara Maradwin. Merwith, actually. Yeah. Merwith. Um, yes, yes. Merwith. Talk to me, darling. Talk, ask, yes. ask me the question. See if I can find you. I've got I three have... people at a time on the screen. Uh -huh. Talk to me, darling. Go on. Talk to me. I, I, have, I have a million questions, so I will just ask you one. Good. Um, when you talked about trying to um, develop both your sutra practice and your tantra practice if you wish yeah. to try to do that at the same time. Yeah. Can yeah. you talk a little bit more about what that should look like or how that can work in a practical sense? Yeah, I mean, at the most simplest, le the simplest level for all of us, maybe, I mean, to, to talk about actually tantric practice in terms of actually transforming, that is the high, that's the, that's the person who is at the level of physics, who's actually Einstein at that level. So they are actually doing the work. So we just have to be faking it till we make it. So the real way we would combine our practice, the fundamentals of practice is you abide by the laws. Of, this is junior school. You've got to keep doing that. Abide by the laws of karma. Don't harm others. Realize that you cause your own suffering and realize you cause your own happiness. So you live in your vows and you do purification every day. And then you learn to work on your mind and you recognize the attachment and the aversion and you learn to avert them and to, and to, and to not follow them. And then on the body have to pass all this is part of it. You are learning then to connect with others and to do what is more beneficial for them than for yourself. And then you add on top of that from your tantra, your, you keep your commitments, you do your practice every day, you do your visualization every day, you do your sadhana every day, you say your mantra every day. These are the external ways of practicing, putting into practice so-called tantra by doing the visualization, by seeing, we're going to discuss this, by seeing yourself as a Buddha, by saying your mantra, and this way transforming yourself at the subtlest level. So that's the level we can apply the so-called tantric practices every day uh, does and, that make and sense? If you, it does um i'm just wondering if you for example get an initiation even though you are not at the level of graduate school um, right. does that help you to do the walk yourself into the part thing or how does that help you to um fake it till you make it in tantra until you're actually actually okay, the so, level this, of being okay so what you're doing 
All right. So at the first level of practice, junior school, entry level, Hinayana level, you control your body and speech. You've got to harness your energy. You can't be berserk for doing what you feel and running driven by attachment and anger. That's cause of suffering. So you're ceasing that. Already you become a bit more content. Then you get to the next level, you start to work on your mind and you start to unpack and unravel the delusions and you become even more content. And then you get to the body subtle path and you're now able to start to connect to others and maybe even try to do what's beneficial for them by keeping your vows and blah, blah, blah. And then at the tantric level, you take your empowerment. So this is getting us to the essence. This is the practice, the daily psychological practice of Tantra is, is what they call deity yoga. Deity is another word in Tantra that use it really is the equivalent of the word Buddha. The word throws us a bit. Deity with a capital D, lowercase d. It's, a, it's an equivalent of the word Buddha that's used in Tantra. So all this is where we now get into these particular practices that are so skillful. So what we're trying, so in Tantra, another, this is a whole other way of approaching as well. What, when, when they say in Tantra, when you do these visualizations, you do this imagine. So let's just say we take an empowerment into the practice of Tara. So we recognize Tara, there she is in the Bodhisattva style, in this green light body. She's holding this and doing that. Her leg is this way. It's a visual language. You learn that language and you learn broadly speaking to know that she represents all the Buddha's qualities, but she particularly, this aspect she shows is of courage, action, confidence, getting things done. That's her kind of character. If you see Chen Rezi, his character is compassion. If you see Manjushri, his character is wisdom. They've all got all the qualities. So you're, so what you're doing is you're basically essentially all the sadhanas, you're visualizing, imagining her out in front of you. Then you construct that visualization in your mind. And then you practice becoming familiar with that visualization. But the way to think about it when you're doing your practice is you're visualizing that she's like a mirror image. She's showing you what you can be like. In other words, you want to play tennis, you go to watch a video of Federer and you watch exactly how he holds the racket. And you see this perfect picture of a perfect tennis player. He's like your ideal, like your, what do they say Jung talks about? Your, um, what's that term Jung uses? I forget the word. So you're visual, you want to become like Federer, don't you? You know, you want to become another Federer. You want to become your Federer. So you watch how Federer plays tennis and you repeat what he does and you try to watch what he does and you try to do exactly as he does it. So you're seeing Tara out there and you're imagining this. She's showing you your potential. So one of the ways they talk about these practices is that you're bringing the future result into the present. So you Im you're not Tara yet. You're not Buddha yet. But by imagining yourself as, so first you visualize Tara out there. And at some point in these sadhanas, you then visualize Tara coming to your crown and you visualize absorbing Tara into you. And then you imagine, I now am Tara. So basically it's faking it till you make it. You're seeing Tara out there. You want to become Tara. You do all these different practices. You do purification, you do this and you do that. And then at some point you visualize her absorbing into you. And then you practice practice seeing yourself as Tara. This is the essence of the psychological approach to these particular practices. In other words, that's another. So the very first level, you're controlling your body and speech You're very because you're aiming to become Tara. So you've got to control the crazy samsaric body and speech. Then you control the crazy samsaric mind, stop the delusions. Then you start to proactively benefit, develop virtue and goodness. Then you visualize yourself as Tara. You bring Tara into you and you imagine you become Tara. So this is a a final method for how you become that Buddha. That's the essence of what you're doing in deity yoga. And that's the essence of, of these practices in Tantra. Are you with me? I'm with you. Yes. Good. Thank you. That's exactly what you're trying to do. You know, so first of all, it's like using the analogy of becoming like Federer. First, you've got to control your body. and You can't even hold a tennis racket yet. So you've got to do lots of purification, control your body, control your speech, control your mind. Then you start to learn more about tennis and then you actually begin to become like Federer and you bring the future result of you, perfect Federer, into the present. Now I am Federer. I am a new, and that's a cause for becoming the Buddha. It's not just fantasy. It's sort of like faking it till you make it. And it's actually, it's the essence of it is what we call in the world positive thinking. You're imagining you are becoming the actual Buddha. You imagine it. And by imagining it is a cause for becoming it. So it's like the ultimate in positive thinking, the ultimate. Tantra is the ultimate in positive thinking. So, of course, the language is not familiar to us. These weird looking green ladies and blue men and multicolored legs and arms and God knows what. It's really weird to us. But we understand this. Of course, it's cultural. Everything's cultural. 
we're, we're cultural, you know, everything's cultural. And if you want to learn a new language, we know we're perfectly capable of it. Just because you're not brought up as a Tibetan, just not because you don't speak Sanskrit, doesn't mean you can't learn it. If there's something useful in Sanskrit, well, then we learn it and we, and we make it our language. So we're making this our psychology, our language, our visual thing. We make it and then we know the meaning of it. By buying into the meaning of it, it becomes real for us. So, okay, now, another, this is how Lama Yeshi would teach us in the West. When he first met a bunch of hippies, he met the Westerners in the 70s, you know, the mid-60s, early 70s. And he could identify straight away that these brilliant beings with their mind, they understand the mind perfectly. <laughs> you can see that in, in the modern world, we're super, we've got super amount, this is why, okay, this is why Lama would always teach how, the t in general, in the teachings, they say that degenerate times are the best time for Tantra. And what that means is degenerate times is when there's bucket loads of attachment. So look at our world. I mean, you go to 10, you go to 14, you know, 21st, 20th century Tibet before 1950 was like 14th century Tibet. No different, I promise. You know, and as Lami Eshi would say, the monasteries were the only place where there was life and energy and color and beauty because all, everything was in the in the monastic system. You know, lay life was boring and gray and boring, you know. But now we look at the modern world, churches are all locked with padlocks and the modern world is full of joy and love and color and attachment, basically. So we're driven by attachment. So it's basically what makes us berserk. We're out of control. That's why Tantra, this concept of utilizing this crazy energy, I mean, we've got to be advanced to do it, is, a, is, is exactly the time for right now why they say Tantra is a perfect time to teach. So Lama would always try to get us the essence. Normally in the teachings, you learn or you go to the monasteries, you learn all the, you control your body, you control your speech, you go to high school, you go to body supper path, and then when you're more advanced, you will then listen to teachings about Tantra. But Lama actually, from day one, he somehow would teach Tantra almost immediately to us. He would try to get us, he said always we, you know, the concept of transforming, the concept of turning yourself into a marvelous person. Instead of the ego's view is I'm set in stone and I'm a load of rubbish, you know. So, and, and it's a way of lifting you up. This is why in these practices, it's like you've got to control your body and speech. That's hard work. You don't want to stuff the fifth piece of cake in. It's hard damn work to do that. And then you got to struggle to be kind to others. And then there's other level of practice. Seeing yourself as Tara, imagining your Tara lifts you. It's very uplifting. It's very kind of joyful. You're identifying with your marvelous future potential. It can lift your mind. And Lama would always teach us these practices from day one. Even the more advanced level, he would try to get us the understanding of logic. He said, in the West, we somehow are so sophisticated technologically, technologically, mentally sophisticated, because we're so deluded, that we understand this concept of transformation. And he always give us these practices from day one. So that this is where it comes into the daily life application of these. So he could see, and he'd always talk about, make jokes about how we had all this self-pity. Poor me. He said, you people don't even know how to be happy. You only know how to be miserable. And this is the irony of ego. And the more we can understand the way Buddha talks about the delusions and, you know, it's self-pity, anger, attachment, self, self, you know, low self-esteem, arrogance, pride. They're all actual voices of a victim. It sounds very brutal to say that. But the more we understand the Buddhist psychological model, the more we can see them in ourselves, the more we can see that they are just the voices of self-pity. Lama Yeshi would call ego the self-pity me. It sounds kind of cruel because life is tough. But it's, it's, the, these voices of ego, these when the, when the delusions are rampant, we can see we are hopeless. We feel we're nothing. We can't achieve anything. We're a garbage. The world is a disaster. It's all not fair. I didn't ask to get born. Look at my life. I'm hopeless. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. That's ego. That's the irony of ego, people. So by lessening ego, by lifting ourselves and by identifying with Tara or Chen Raising all these Buddhas, it lifts you. And actually, it's a sign of self-respect. So we're really applying this tantric concept in daily life, the way Lama Yeshi talks. They talk about developing divine pride. I mean, what a wonderful saying, divine pride, instead of this constant addiction, I'm nothing, I'm nobody, I'm nothing, I'm nobody, you know? So you're identifying with being the Buddha, with becoming the Buddha. So you lift yourself up. That means you have self-respect. That means you wouldn't just go, Blur, I'm hopeless, I'm nothing, I'm nobody. That's almost like we have a tantric vow. The vows of tantric vows, you have a vow not to abuse yourself. We love to abuse ourselves. 
I'm hopeless. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. We'd vomit out our mouths. So Lama could see this self-pity way that we were. Ah. So by giving us these practices, it's the opposite. You're identifying with becoming the Buddha, blissful, joyful, radiant. It's not fantasy. It's your potential. So it, then, it, then you develop the sense of self-respect. So then what you present to the world is not the self-pity, sad me, but is a joyful, kind, empathetic, compassionate me. How amazing, how marvelous. It's a gift to yourself and to others. So these practices can really lift us if we can get the sense of psychologically what they're meaning, you know. This is all talking tantric. This is tantric psychology, speaking very simply on the earth in daily life, you know. <clears throat> Are we communicating, people? Are we communicating? Maybe. Does it make sense? Yes, it makes great sense. Good. <laughs> Thank job. you. Yes. Okay. Who else is there? There. Who, hang on. Yes. Go talk to me. I can't see people's names. Yeah, David. Talk to me, David. Good. So if, if we're talking about Tara, it seems that she's just an intermediary. And what we're really trying to focus on is just, you know, the emptiness of our own consciousness of our own mind, you know, if we merge Tara coming from the outside with, you know, our Tara nature, what we're really focusing on is getting rid of the I and becoming Tara, getting rid of the subject object. Exactly. But she's not really anybody. Mean, what what do you mean by intermediary? David, what do you mean by intermediary? Well, I mean, we could have picked anyone if we're looking at emptiness of our mind we, we didn't have to pick Tara but that's the object to get to well that's so it's the one she should you know, Roger Federer has to be out there for us to show me how to become my Federer and eventually in guru yoga you 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 don't just think she's an intermediary you don't throw her away you become you identify when you realize emptiness you become oneness with Tara. You are Tara and Tara is you. So it's a method, yes, for you not just to realize the emptiness of your mind, because you, yes, you've got to realize the emptiness of your mind, that's your true nature, but then you have to show to others. And that's when you become Tara now for others. So you're saying, I'm agreeing, I'm just adding a few words to what you're saying. Are we communicating, David? Well, I mean, yeah, we have Tara and nature. But we have everyone's nature. We have every Buddha's nature. Yeah, but all Buddhas are the same with each other. They're, they're all the same. It's just a question of what personality we have. And as we can see, it's a good point, David. So we can see, can't we, that we've all got different style. Some of us are more big, small, soft, quiet, slow, fast. And if we're doing it on this path, then that's why we learn to identify with a particular yidda. That particular Buddha is the one that works for our personality in this life. Could be Tara, could be Yamantaka, could be male, could be female, could be peaceful, could be wrathful. They're the different manifestations. You're absolutely right. But when we see the true nature of all of those, when we realize the Dharmakaya, the emptiness of our mind, then they are all just different manifestations of the same Buddha mind. So, yes, they're techniques, they're methods to help us to accomplish our own Buddha nature. You're absolutely right. So we're saying the same thing, David. I'm adding just different words. Are we communicating, David? We are not communicating. But are you sure you're, you're content with what I'm saying, or is there some is there some still some questions there? Well, you know, we picked Tara as an example of a Buddha. My only thinking was that everyone has Buddha nature. So whoever we pick is a personal choice, but in the That's end- right. Of course it is. That goes without saying, of course. It's just the method one needs to use. You might like Federer. I might prefer, you know, I might prefer um, another player, you know. They're all the same. They lead us to the same thing. It's true. Exactly right, David. Exactly. Exactly, yes. Exactly, David, yes. Who else is there? Thank you. Thank you, darling. Who else is there? Other questions? Any we other have questions? a question in the chat from Chris yes. Venerable, um, and it starts, thank you, Venerable, just before you spoke about the three principal aspects of the path, you mentioned the most sophisticated use of energy bliss, at which point my audio died. Would you please put this comment into context? Thank you. What was the point we wanted context for? Um, it states, before you spoke about the three principal aspects of the path, you mentioned the most sophisticated use of energy bliss. Uh, I did, which... Okay, those words, I'm, I've got to, okay, I hear you. I'm kind of trying to remember what I did say, because those are words, I wouldn't have said exactly those words. Um, 
Okay, I think I said what I was saying is talking about attachment. If, if we can see that attachment is the main problem, then at the first level of practice, you control the servants of attachment, the body and speech. The next level, you get in touch with the attachment itself and you begin to subdue the attachment itself. Next level, you go to add body cheetah to the mix, compassion. And then you even there are using a working, learning to work with attachment, you know, mitigated by adding compassion to the mix and virtues. And then finally, at the most sophisticated level of practice, when you've accomplished renunciation, bodhicitta and emptiness, and you've taken empowerments, and you are a, a, a genuine yogi or yogini, there, it's just technical. There's something about, you know, the, okay, bliss is just this word, that's another word for very happy. This is a really important point. Okay, let's look at this a bit. We learned this in low rig. We learned that we've got deluded states of mind, anger, attachment, jealousy. We learn that we've got positive states of mind, love, compassion, empathy, you know, forgiveness, all these words. We know these, and these are the crucial ones we have to distinguish between because the first lot causes suffering and the second lot causes us happiness. The first lot causes us to harm others and the second lot causes us to help others. So this is the fundamental job of being a Buddhist. Then we've got this third category of states of mind. And these I like to call the mechanics like concentration, good memory, alertness, discrimination. These are crucial parts of our mind that whether you're a murderer or a meditator, you need these to function. They're neither virtuous nor non-virtuous in their character. And we need to cultivate these in order to do the job of distinguishing between delusions and virtue. Now, curiously, and this is really what I want to talk about here, there's another state of mind in there that's simply called feeling not the equivalent of what we mean by emotion this is hard to hear initially because we, that's not how we think but this there's only ever three kinds of feeling we have one is called happy feelings or pleasant feelings one is called unhappy or unpleasant feelings and one is called neutral so for this discussion here let's forget the neutral so we know we are driven, every being in the universe, Buddha says, is driven by the wish to only have pleasant feelings. When we say happiness, because we're so addicted to believing the chocolate cake causes it, or the brand new boyfriend causes it, that we even conflate the word happiness with the object. When we think about happiness, you, you, I say, tell me about your happiness, Rabina. I'll tell you all about the cake. But the cake is merely the trigger, that's simply the catalyst, such that when I have contact with it, this is the words, happy feelings are triggered in here. This is the whole point that Buddha's telling us. And we've got a total mistaken concept in our mind. We believe totally that cake, boyfriends, handbags, praise, the weather, external events, they are the cause, the direct cause of the happy feelings. We all believe that. That's the samsaric philosophical view, and that is what leads us to nightmare and misery because it's a lie, Buddha says. This is a, and this is a technologically a sophisticated point that the cake is merely a catalyst, and it does trigger happy feelings. But the Buddha is telling us those happy feelings don't last because the more you eat the cake, they turn into unhappy feelings and now you want to vomit. This we know, but because we're addicted to believing that the cake is cause of the happy feelings, we keep eating it until we want to vomit and then we forgot we've lost the plot. So he says we've got a completely mistaken philosophy in the mind. This is the samsaric philosophy that that a tip, that 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 cake is the cause of the happiness, the happy feelings. Cake is there, happy feelings are here. And attachment is this fantasy, greedy monster inside us that makes us believe that cake will make me happy. It does trigger happiness, but it's not the main cause of the happiness. This is a crucial point that you have to learn in the middle scope. If you don't understand this, you do not understand how to use the bliss, and this is the word here, and bliss is just a very nice word for very, very, very happy feelings. That's all it is. Use no way in the universe can you use that bliss, as I'm about to describe, on the tantric path. Forget it. 
you're out the window. It's sort of a big joke. So happy feelings. The other option is unhappy feelings, unpleasant feelings. And we know we have a whole spectrum of those. And the, and the, and the ugly cake that makes you vomit triggers the unhappy feelings. The boyfriend's mean words trigger the unhappy feelings. You know, the, the, the bad weather triggers unhappy feelings. And, of course, we make the mistake of thinking the boyfriend is the main cause of the happy, unhappy feelings. And what's another word for unhappy feelings? Suffering. So happiness is another word for happy feelings. Suffering is another word for unpleasant feelings. And we have many, many very happy feelings, mild happy feelings, many, many unpleasant feelings, and really unpleasant feelings when you're raped or murdered or attacked or dropped a bomb on you. But these are the, not the main cause of our unhappy feelings. And this is, a, this is a samsaric story. This is exactly what Buddha is telling us back in junior school and high school. I'm sorry, Rabina, that atomic bomb is not the cause of your main, main cause of your suffering. It's your past karma that caused you to be in the place where the atomic bomb fell. It caused your past negative karma caused you to be in the front of that boyfriend who punched you in the nose. And your virtuous karma in the past is the main cause of why you meet a boyfriend who's kind to you. This is his technical explanation of happiness and suffering. Karma is an explanation of what happiness and where it comes from and suffering and where it comes from. So you've got to have karma down first. Then you have to go dig deep, drill down into the mind and distinguish between virtue and non-virtue and then understand these mechanical parts of the mind and understand the meaning of the word happy feeling, pleasant feeling, joyful feeling, ecstatic feeling, rapturous feeling, blissful feeling. That it's a spectrum of happy feelings and they're neither good nor bad, but we all want them. So Buddha's saying, hey guys, I've found a method of how you can get such happy feelings, you won't believe it. The first method is stop harming others. The second method is give up attachment, the junkie. The third method is practice compassion. And the fourth method, the quickest one, is practice tantra. All of these are methods for you to become a blissfully happy person very, very quickly. And then, of course, you add bodhicitta and it helps you help others. This is the logic of the entire Buddhist path, okay? So the word bliss. Even when you get shine, even when you get shamatha, this is a technique that the Hindus before the Buddha invented. These genius yogis invented this brilliant psychological skill that enables you to completely subdue the deluded parts of the mind to access a subtler level of mind that we don't even posit as existing in the modern world. Beyond the brain, beyond conceptuality, beyond sensory. These genius Indians 3,000 years ago invented this. And this technique, which Buddha took with him when he diverged in his own direction, is called single-pointed concentration, called shamatha called samadhi, single point of concentration. It's this brilliant skill that enables you to completely plumb the depths of your own mind to levels of subtlety that we don't even know exist. Now, as Lama Yeshi points out in his Mahamudra book, straightforwardly, that the, the, the levels of joy and bliss and ecstasy and rapture, whatever damn word you want for very happy feelings, you can't even imagine the level of rapture, joy, ecstasy, bliss that you can accomplish. And that Buddha's telling us it's the natural state of our mind. You don't get it from, you know, it's, it's, it's the natural state of your mind. And by getting single point of concentration, you access it. And it's blissful, it's peaceful, it's calm, it's unneurotic, it's undiluted, it's, it, that even is just getting shamatha. And the Buddha says we've had single point of concentration countless lifetimes. So that's the natural state of our mind to the degree that it's unencumbered by garbage and delusions. So the tantric yogi who has given up harming others, who's living in vows, who's given up attachment, who's given up anger, given up attachment, given up anger, has got bodhicitta. They can engage in these things, get single point of concentration, visualize themselves as a deity, internalize that, uh, become the deity, ex ex experience their own subtle mind and the utter incredible bliss that is energized by contact, even in your meditation, by visualizing this blissful radiant deity. It triggers intense bliss in your own mind. And now the point about that bliss, it's highly technical. That bliss combined with concentration makes the mind the subtlest possible. It enables you to get to the clear light mind, which is like the microscope of your mind. So the combination of shine, concentration and bliss, triggered by contact with an attachment object, enables your mind to get to the subtlest level. And that's what you can get enlightened in.
That is the mind, the level of mind you can use to get enlightened. And that's why all of it's technical. All of it is, the, is to help you get to the subtlest level of your mind, energized by contact with an, an, an attachment object, which energizes that bliss, which because you don't any longer have attachment and grasping and greed, you are able to utilize it to get your mind to the subtlest level, the level of the clear light mind and the greatest yogis can then become enlightened at that level. That's the explanation. Okay. It's technical. Thank you, Venerable. And all the garbage, vomit, disgusting talk in the West about tantric. It's so, so, so repulsive. I don't want to use the words, you know, it's so repulsive. It's so disgusting. It's so grotesque how people talk. I've got no idea what they're talking about. Any more questions? So, okay. How do you start using bliss? I'll tell you. You eat your bloody piece of chocolate cake. I'm sorry, Australians can say bloody. It's not rude for Australians. But I won't say it because I'm in America. I promise I'll be polite. Just forget about using the bliss for your lovely boyfriend. Just take start with the chocolate cake, okay? So before you shove the cake in, anticipating all that happiness when we're so greedy, you, you don't shove it in. You first, you think it doesn't have a true nature because you've got to realize emptiness. You can't do this without emptiness. Forget it. Without this, forget, without emptiness, this is a joke. So you've got to realize it has no intrinsic nature of being that cake that looks so divine from out there. It's energizing your pleasure. It's energizing the, you know, the, the, the kind of anticipation. So you think, it is delicious, and this is it has no intrinsic nature. It's going to trigger some pleasure, and I'm going to offer this pleasure to the Buddha, and I'm going to hope that this pleasure eventually transforms into my clear light mind so I can become a Buddha and transform myself completely. And then you happily eat the cake. That's how you can transform ordinary pleasure into daily life. It's nothing complicated. Or even, your, like I said, your attachment for your baby. If it's only attachment, you'll eat your baby for breakfast. But you add love and compassion to the mix, you mitigate, you lessen, you chain, you, you soften the attachment so then it becomes something valuable. This is how you can utilize, you can transform, you can change by adding virtue to the mix, by adding emptiness to the mix. It's, everything's a way of seeing it. it's different, you know. So what other questions were there, there, Anna? Yes, we have Alona. Yes, Alona. Good, darling. Talk to me. Hi, Venerable. Thank oh, you for your teachings. Let me see if I can find you. Go on. <laughs> Three people at a time. Go on. Talk to me, Alona. Um, I want to ask you about um, um, utilizing energy of aversion. Sorry, what? Uh, say it again. Of utilizing energy of aversion. Okay, well, let's keep it simple and just say, how can I utilize anger? Just keep it simple. Don't say energy. It gets a bit too fancy. How can I work with anger is that what you're trying to say so what give an example for example give an example of what you mean by that in the situation well, i am um, um my teacher she criticized me so uh for my uh, paper so i um my you know um attachment to reputation they're like oh, i was angry the anger arose i was yeah so but i didn't respond to her i've seen this anger i've seen what's happening in my mind so i use that energy to write another paper which should be done over five months and i wrote it in a month by just using that energy okay so let's just okay let's analyze it's good okay let's analyze let's analyze let's analyze it so to be technical you had anger towards this person who who, who didn't who said your work wasn't good and out of anger, and you're saying you used it because you, you, you use this to then write another paper in one month. Well, I would say that's just called pride. You just made it worse. That's not using anger at all. You just double, you added pride onto it and made it double trouble. Unless you decided, thank you. For, this is, you can't use that anger. That anger you can't use. There's only one solution is to take the criticism, accept what she said, and be so happy you've been criticized because now you can see your garbage mind. And then out of enthusiasm, not arrogance, I'm going to then do a better job. You can't, that anger, you cannot transform. And that energy you're calling it, I would not say that's virtuous. That just sounds like pride. You've got to prove to her that, you can, that, that you're better than she thinks. That's called pride, baby. So that's not transforming anger. That's just adding another delusion on top of anger. You can't transform that anger. The time of transforming anger is if, you know, is if you're, um, is if you're, 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 you're a mother and you tell your child off looking like you're being angry, but genuinely motivated by compassion. That's the only time. So any delusion you're using has to be underpinned by a virtue. 
So oh, you, I would suggest that. I mean, with very blunt, I'd say that was just that energy wasn't transforming anger. You use it to prove to her that you're better than she thought. And that's called pride. So better change it. Okay, baby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, Michael, did you have your hand raised? Where's Michael? Yes, I was just, I was wondering. Hello, Michael, talk to me. Good, I can see you. In, in, on, on, on the Burzen site, when he's talking oh, about. Start again, uh, start again. Sorry, start again. What? On the Burzen site. Oh, good. Study yeah. Alex Burzen's website. Yes. Yes, on, on his website where he's talking about downfalls to the Bodhisattva vows. Yes. One of the things he says for the ninth vow is that to disregard vital teachings. But my, but but my question. But my I'm, question. I'm confused. I'm confused. What does he mean by that? that? That one of the downfalls of one of the downfalls of the ninth vow is to disregard something that you've been taught. Oh, I see. So to arrogantly say no, that's not true, or something. Arrogantly say no, that's not true. Oh, okay, on, good, good, good. So go on. Right, no, on, on the other hand, I've heard you, and I've heard His Holiness, and I've heard my other teachers say that you know you have to you, you have to try it on, and, and and take what makes sense. So how do you how do you hear a teaching? If you yes. disagree, if it doesn't make sense to you. No, I understand. I, there's what, a massive difference, Michael. That's really not complicated. That's okay. really not complicated. I would suggest if you, I mean, I haven't, let me just see if I can, I haven't got the course notes in front of me, but I would suggest it's a breaking of vow. It's a downfall when if you reject the teaching because you think it's a load of rubbish and you just dismiss it. That's not taking it on and then putting it on the, on the, on the back burner. That's it's driven by arrogance and, 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 and sort of smarty pants. That is completely different from not, you know, Buddha says, don't believe a single word I tell you. That's completely different. So you're listening with humility. You're listening to this teaching with the assumption this person knows what they're talking about, but they say a certain teaching you don't understand. You leave it there. That's not disregarding it. But disregarding it would only be a non-virtue if it's driven by a delusion. So you've got to look at the delusion that's driving it. It can be driven by a virtue, which means it's not a downfall. You can leave it there because you can't comprehend it. That's completely different. So you have to see the motivation. That's the key in that case. Absolutely the key. That makes sense, doesn't it, Michael? Absolutely. Thank you, Venerable. Yeah, that's absolutely, it's really important. one. And the thing is for me, I mean, the feeling I've got, again, use a simple example of Federer. I like always all the examples. And he tells me to do some tricky backhand and I haven't got a clue what he's talking about. It's too advanced for me. But I trust that Federer knows what he's talking about. So I leave it there for now rather than, oh, Federer doesn't know what he's talking about. How can that be true? Then that's a real problem for your mind, isn't it? It's a big difference. The motivation has to be the difference. Michael, because what makes the body such vows broken isn't the action, it's the motivation. That's the key to remember. The first level, it's the action that breaks the vow. But here, it's not the action that breaks the vow. It's the motivation that compels you to do the action. That's the crucial difference with body such vows. You with me? It's clear, isn't it? Good. Thank you, Michael. Good point. Otherwise, we have this blind faith and I, oh, I shouldn't be questioning and we're scaredy baby. That's no good. That's ridiculous. That's a disaster. Thank you, Michael. Very good point. Who else is? What else is there, Anna? Uh, no more hands raised or questions. Okay. okay. So then let's talk about then. So the, the general way, the, the one that I find most powerful, forget the technical ability of the greatest yogis to utilize the bliss that's energized by contact with an attachment object because they're the right words. Just to try to get the general, this is where Lama would try to show us how by, you know, even thinking I've got Buddha nature, even thinking I've got potential, stopped identifying with my garbage, Rabina, stop showing oh, I'm hopeless, I'm nothing, I'm nobody, I'm garbage. And when someone says to you, how are you? And you vomit out all your rubbish. It's like it's an insult to someone else for a start. So it's amazing practice. You know, you're not developed yet. You know, you've got attachment or diversion. But how about when someone asks you, how are you? I'm really well. Straight away, right there, you're subduing your, your unhappy self-centeredness, you know. And then even the action, this is also bodhicitta. Even the action, I always quote this, and maybe it sounds funny, but I love it. This is before I was a Buddhist, I heard Grace Kelly say, Grace Kelly, that wonderful actor, of course I have to look beautiful. People have to look at me. Now, I always noticed there's Charlene. Charlene always dresses up. She's going to look at her with the nice jewels around her neck. She wears a paints and nails. I think she always looks lovely. She's doing a Grace Kelly. 
She's thinking of other people. I mean, I'm not, she might be vain as well. That's her business. But when you know that other people have to look at you, this is bodhisattva and it's tantric. You know, you're looking like a deity. You make yourself look beautiful, motivated by the wish to make people happy. But look at the difference it does to you. If you walk around like an old drag with smelly armpits, of course you've got low self-esteem. Okay, if you're a yogi in the mountains, you can be naked and pick your nose in peace. It doesn't matter. But if you're in the public among human beings, for their sake, you look nice. But for your own sake, you know yourself, if you're going to a party, and you dress up. This is something so simple. This is tantric psychology. You dress up to look beautiful. So then you become this, you kind of, then you, and it lifts you. It lifts you. If you go to some person's party and the toilet smells and the food's on the floor and the dog shits around the corner there, it's very depressing. It's not going to lift you at all. But if you look nice and the people look nice, it can, if you've done it with the right motivation, it, look, it, it lifts you from this self-pity, I'm nothing and I'm nobody. So even making a conscious effort to look nice for other people is bodhicitta. And then if you've got the tantric one, thinking of I'm Tara, presenting myself to others. Because it's the, ta the tantric practices are oneness with bodhicitta. You can't separate them from bodhicitta. This is marvelous. We get this one, you know. We get this. We understand it. It lifts you. It's very skillful. That's tantric philosophy. Tantric psychology, I promise. Um, and they say, what about mantra? Okay, you see, we've got body, we've got speech, and we've got mind. So, you know, as before the point that, um, who was it made? David, I think, or Christopher, I think, which one? David, Michael, which one? That point about David, about the point about, yeah, of course, all of it's just a means to help us get in touch with the emptiness of our mind. That is true. But we, we, we've got the mind. That's the, when we have accomplished Buddhahood, we've achieved the Dharmakaya. The Dharmakaya just means truth body, but it's referring to the enlightened mind. It's referring to the enlightened mind. When you've accomplished, you've perfected the realization of emptiness and you've, with bodhicitta in the mix, and your mind is now perfected. That's pure, unmanifest, all seeing, all pervasive all compassionate consciousness and it's just, it's just that's that pure buddha and all buddhas are that but now you've got to help sentient beings so you need speech and you need body that's for the sake of others buddhas do not need body and do not need speech baby they've done the job but to benefit sentient beings you need speech and body and that's where the practice of tantra comes in so by practicing seeing yourself as a deity slowly slowly you transform your own subtle energies literally into the sambhogakaya the subtle light body of that buddha your subtler physical energies mixed with your subtle mind manifest as that deity literally that that purifies the body but then mantra sanskrit the sanskrit sounds by all the lamas say that, that they never they don't translate the mantras they're always sanskrit i say that's the purest sound and in the tantric aspect the tantric view of the, how we're made up we see we've got gross body which is inextricably linked to our gross mind which is our sensory consciousness then we have subtle body which is the subtle central the nervous the subtle 72000 subtle channels coursing through our body from head to toe and through all those channels are coursing these subtle wind energies or prana which is the subtle physical energy and then inextricably linked to all those different wind energies are our different mental states this is clearly not neuro neuroscience it's obviously different you know so all of our mental states, like attachment and love and compassion, they're all connected to their own wind energies, inextricably connected, and they're coursing through these different uh, subtle nervous system. So this is the basis of, of, of Tibetan medicine. Your, your Tibetan doctor will feel your pulses, and she'll feel the imbalance of those different wind energies, which she's familiar with, and she will know that that particular wind is connected to your attachment mind. So she gives you herbal medicines that calms the physical wind energy down, which helps calm your attachment down. If you've got the anger one, all the different states of mind, they can recognize by the winds which state of mind it is that's causing the problem. It's such a sophisticated holistic system. It's amazing, you know. So, so there's this intimate, inextricable relationship between the winds and the mind. They say the mind rides on the winds. So then, you know, this is how karma works as well, as Lama Zopa said, just by having a negative thought, not even speech yet, 
that pollutes your mind, that programs your mind with that tendency. And then because that mind, that level of mind is inextricably linked to those winds, it pollutes your wind energies. And in turn, that manifests as one life or other or even future in this life as physical sickness. And then in turn, over many lifetimes, that impacts, impacts upon the external elements and it causes the imbalance of the external elements. This is called environmental karma. So what starts in our mind is the cause of the entire universe. This is why you can have hell realms and spirit realms and God realms. It's the minds of those beings programmed in that negativity, which programs those wind energies that causes you to take one birth or other in another life as a suffering being, like a hell being, and your external environment is this fire energy. I mean, it's literally explained, you know, these are all made by minds. So the Vajrayana model describes this in great detail. So in the same way that you can pollute and poison your mind and your body, you can purify it. So sound is mantra. Sound is the wind energy. And the purest wind energy is mantra. So just by, this is one way of applying tantra every day. You say mantra. You say the Jin Raising mantra, the Tara mantra. I mean, Lama Zopa's got so many mantras that nobody else has even heard of. They all got their own tech, little kind of specific antidote for this one, for that one, for this poison, for that one, for that delusion, for that sickness. There's so many of these marvelous mantras. And by so saying that sound, you purify your mind and your body. This is Tantra. It's amazing. It's marvelous. It's so skillful. All the techniques are there. So you purify your speech. First, you purify your speech by being silent. Just shut your mouth, okay? Second, you purify it by actively not lying, bad-mouthing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you purify it by actively saying mantra. And even just by saying good words, by saying kind words, just by saying kind words, you purify the mind and you purify the wind, which is your speech. This is how we turn ourselves into Buddhas every day using these techniques are we communicating it's not mystical it's not mystical i promise it's psychology very brilliant psychology all of it every bit of it So this is something, again, about happy feelings and unhappy feelings. They're not delusions. They're not virtues. That's why if you don't study the Buddhist view of the mind that can distinguish between a deluded, neurotic misconception, attachment, anger, jealousy, pride, a virtuous, valid state of mind, love, compassion, you know, all the rest, plus these, these neither virtuous nor non-virtuous, but are crucial states of mind, concentration, good memory, discrimination, alertness, vigilance, feeling. It's a very specific model. And if you don't study these three characteristics, you won't understand what it means, feeling, bliss, ecstasy, because we confuse them with attachment. We think happy feelings and attachment are the same. They're completely different states of mind, completely different states of mind. When we understand this, we can start to navigate our mind and work with it skillfully, which is the Buddhist view, you know. We all want happy feelings. And all Buddha's saying is, honey, I found some methods to get really happy feelings, such the likes of which you have never had before. I mean, he's getting, he's exciting us, but we just hear it as misery. You know, I've got to give up attachment, give up happiness. We so misunderstand because we don't study it properly. I mean, not that I have, but what bit that I know I'm trying to express. Any questions? People? Any questions of any description? Two o'clock, another half an hour. Time goes quick. I have a short question, Rabina. When you talk about happiness and you talk about bliss, is yeah. there a difference between happiness and between the bliss that you are said to achieve when you have understood emptiness or reached enlightenment? Course, are there degree, different qualities? Of, of course it is. It's a question of degree. That's all. It's degree. That's all. It's a degree. Can you see what I'm saying? Yes. I was just wondering if there's anything qualitative about it, not just degree, but also a what kind of What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that, darling? Qualitative. That means um, much, it's much better bliss, much happy bliss, and it's not polluted by delusions. Right. Okay, good, good. Listen, listen. The bliss we have now, the pleasure we have now, whether it's from the best boyfriend on the planet or whether it's from cake, 
whatever the object is. You understand? This is how we get pleasure now. Would you agree with that? We get pleasure yes. by meeting certain con by meeting objects. Would you agree with that? Yes, it's very well, mundane. What it's telling yes. us? Okay, now think of a junkie. Well, think of an alcoholic. Think of a person who's got lots of attachment. Because attachment is just junkie mind. It's a question of degree. Can you get that? Yes. So attachment to cake is the same as attachment to alcohol, is the same as attachment to killing, is the same as attachment to torture. It's a question of the habit in your mind and a question of the, the strength of the attachment. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Are you with me? So, okay. Um, so we all believe, this is the samsara you. You know, so for example, that little boy fisherman, whom I always a story I use, due to his past killing karma, he came into this life, he got a human body, nice boy, he met fishing at the age of five or something, and what happened is it's like a memory of killing triggered. As soon as he saw fishing, it, it's like it triggered a memory. He, don't, he doesn't call it a memory. It's suddenly, what happened is this, this is technically what happens. I'm getting to your answer. So the past karma of killing is still in his mind because he hasn't purified it. So he meets the condition called fishing. It triggers like the memory. And the stronger the habit of past killing, this is what happens. This next millisecond, the moment he made contact with fishing, what it triggered was a very happy feeling. A very happy feeling. A pleasant feeling. He'd even call it a joyful feeling. That's called happiness. But what he therefore thinks that fishing is the cause. And that would be reasonable. When you put your cake in the mouth, it triggers a pleasant feeling. So the samsaric philosophy says, ah, the cake is the cause, which is why you keep eating it. And then what also kicks in is attachment, which then exaggerates the deliciousness of fishing. It exaggerates the deliciousness of the cake. This is technically how we're paralyzed in samsara. You meet the fishing, it triggers the memory and the strengths of his habit of killing equals the strength of the pleasure triggered right then. This is the tragedy of samsara. So then and then attachment kicks in and makes it look divine. And so, of course, he believes fishing is the cause of those happy feelings. Of course, we believe that boyfriend is the cause of happy feelings. Of course, we believe the cake is the cause of the happy feelings. It triggers the happy feelings. It is not the main cause of the happy feelings. And the strength of the habit of that sex, the strength of the habit of the killing, the strength of the habit of eating cake, equals the strength of the happy feelings. And this is the tragedy of samsara. And then attachment kicks in and makes you believe it's divine. And then you keep wanting to do it. And then you just lead yourself to hell because what you've done is destroy the happiness. It's, and this is the, the point I'm getting at is this. So the one point, the key point, the qualitative difference. The, the, more, the stronger the habit to eat the cake, jump on the boy, or do any of the other attachment actions, including harming others, is equals the strength of the happiness. But it's the happiness of a junkie. You look at that pleasure. I mean, if a person you're fully involved in being a junkie, a heroin addict or an alcoholic, or you're eating your you know, food because the habit is so strong, you know that to even call it pleasure is like a joke. Because you keep eating the cake, hoping more pleasure will come. But as you keep eating the cake, as you get more cake, as you get more habit, the pleasure diminishes and it just becomes desperate pleasure. Can you get that point so far? Yes. yes. So the happiness that we get on the basis of getting an object of attachment is actually really polluted, really grasping, really contaminated and really desperate. Can you hear that? Yes. But all Buddha is saying is, hey, guys, I found a method. When you've given up attachment, and you've given up delusions, and you've got your and you've accessed your subtle mind, the joy that you will forget even emptiness, baby, the joy you will experience is uncontaminated. It's just utter blissful, radiant, calm joy. It is not desperate. It is not frantic. It is not the joy of a junkie. It's pure, unelaborated, unbelievable. We can't even conceive of it because we don't know any joy that isn't triggered by attachment. So when it's no attachment, you access your own mind, your own natural potential for joy. That's even just getting shamatha, forget emptiness, because there's no delusions there, even temporarily. So it's unequivocal, incredible bliss, but it's not desperate. It's utterly peaceful. It's utterly peaceful. That's the part that's completely new to us. Can you hear me now? I can, yes. That's the answer. Yes, it is. Thank Everybody you. Who's even had a slight experience in meditation 
They all say the joy, you can't describe it because it's so peaceful. And you look at the joy we have now, it's not peaceful. The more the attachment, the more it is totally jagged and, fr and frantic and completely eye-based. It's even a joke to call. It's like the joy, I use this example. Remember when I was in Tibet, you go to the toilet on these planks of wood and the shit goes way down. And there are these wild pigs with their mouth open waiting for the hot shit. That's the level of joy we have now by eating the cake and having the boy, okay? Just to give an example. Are we communicating? Okay. The first That's way? a very graphic example. Yes, Thank we communicate perfectly. Okay. <laughs> so this is what Buddha's telling us, but it sounds so mean of Buddha, like he's telling us to give up happiness. No, he says, I've got a much better happiness for you. But we can't hear it, you know. Do you understand? I do. Thank you. Very now, much. this is why in ordinary daily life, listen to this. The other thing Buddha's saying is very simple. Happy feelings. This is the other point that's very depressing when you think about the fisherman. So we, if we ask, if we ask the question, well, if that cake does trigger happiness and the killing of the fish does trigger happiness, then if it's only a trigger, what's the main cause? This is the question we've got to ask. And this is Buddha's simple answer in the Four Noble Truths. The main cause for that one moment of happy feeling is a past virtuous action that's such that it was just triggered by, and that's the tragedy, by contacting the fishing. I don't know how it works. It's so peculiar. It triggers your little bank vault of virtuous seeds. And one of those virtuous seeds is triggered as a happy feeling. But you have to kill the fish to trigger it. So it's sort of like you, you're using your money for toilet paper. Every time you get your money out of the ATM, which is the fruit of your virtue, you use it to wipe your bottom. That's the problem with the happiness we get now. It's so tragic. It's tr the, the main cause of any happy feeling is a past virtuous action, the seeds of which are in your little bank vault. And then the tragedy is by eating cake, by killing fish and by harming others, it triggers one of those seeds and it ripens as a moment of happiness. So this is why samsara is so utterly, utterly tragic. We're tipping our virtuous seeds down the toilet, using them to harm others and create more suffering. That's the tragedy. Whereas well, maybe Buddha's saying... What? Go on. Or maybe do we just mistake that initial feeling for happiness and it's not happiness at all? Maybe we but just mistake. That, am I? But I didn't say that, did I? And I'm telling you Buddha's teachings, honey. Uh, I'm telling you Buddha's teachings. It is a hap it's in this third category, remember? No, no, you're making it fantastic, you're making it too mystical. The third category of states of mind are called neutral, but I say they're the mechanics. It's better right. to call them mechanics. So feeling is one of those, and it's either a pleasant feeling, unpleasant, or neutral. And honey child, oh. every millisecond of a sentient being existing, as long as time exists, every millisecond you're either having a happy feeling or an unhappy feeling. Forget the neutral. So we only want the happy feelings, and we think the cake causes it, so we keep making a mess, and we only don't want the happy feelings. But in fact, the happy feeling is the fruit of a virtue, and the unhappy right. feeling is the fruit of a non-virtue. And the happy feelings we have now are continuous contaminated and are like the happiness of a junkie that's why they're not they are happy but they're contaminated happy whereas we can have pure happiness like they call it pure don't be mystical about that that means so then this is even why even looking at your daily life we all know people who are just kind and good who help others we can see that we know people who are like that look at their faces they are happy look at their faces they are joyful because why? Because they've practiced the habit of being virtuous. So you know any time in your life, if you do the analysis and you are genuinely kind to a person, that triggers a happy feeling and it's a more pure happy feeling than the happiness triggered by the chocolate cake. We know this. And if we can know this, it gives us courage to practice virtue and stop practicing non-virtue. Because we are the beneficiaries. This is not moralistic. We are the beneficiaries of this. We get happy. Do not discount by being kind and loving and forgiving and compassionate. Are we communicating? We are. Good. What else, people? We have Victoria has raised her hands. Hi, Victoria. Hello. Okay, Hello. Talk Hello, sweetheart. Talk to me. Hello. So my question is actually a bit mundane. Um, it, has to, it has to do with before when you mentioned if you get an invitation, for example, to come to someone's dinner to come yeah. 
do something with someone. Sure. Where, where does the discernment lie between accepting every invitation you receive? Motivation. Uh, motivation, Victoria. Motivation. You've got to know your own mind. This is why these body type of vows are more sophisticated because you haven't done the inner work in the wisdom wing of knowing your mind and knowing when you're following attachment and knowing when you're not following attachment. That's the inner work of being your own therapist. If you don't know your own mind well enough, you won't know the difference. It's you knowing your own mind and being consciously deciding. So, you, you know, I ring you up and I'm, I ring you up and say, come for dinner, Victoria. And you're comfortable. You're sitting there comfortable. There's no logical reason why you shouldn't come for dinner. But you, you try to keep a body type of vow. You want to seriously keep a body type of vow. You would notice your mind being happy to be comfortable. And you decide, no, I'd like to give Rabina the opportunity of being virtuous. And I know it sounds kind of weird because we don't think this way. It doesn't mean you have to do it every time, but it's the motivation that makes it virtuous or not. And if you don't know your own mind, you won't know the difference. So if you're just being a naive little girl, want to make everyone happy, that's not virtue. That's just being self-centered. Then you become a mess and you get used by other people. You're coming mm -hmm. like, yes, girl. That's not virtue. That's just followed. That's driven by attachment to being liked. Mm -hmm. You get my point? So you've got to know your own mind, darling. You've got to know your own mind, Victoria, and be in charge of it. Mm -hmm. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Does it make sense? I think so. Good, yeah. darling. And then you'd have the courage to say, because you see it's not beneficial. No, Rabina, I'm busy tonight. Even if I get upset with you, because you, you have confidence, it's the right answer. So that have that kind of wisdom is not easy, because we're so driven by to make everyone happy in a, in a, a neurotic way, you know, by attachment. That's not virtue. Mm. You understand, Victoria? Mm -hmm. Good, good, darling. What else, people? <coughs> Who else is there? Anna, any other questions? No more questions as of yes. Huh? We won't, oh, because something's happened. Wait a minute. Oh, okay. No more again. Oh, sorry. Go on and talk to me. We've got 15 minutes left. Time goes so quick. I can't believe it. Have I talked enough about Tantra? I think I have. I think I've given an overview. I hope I have. Levels of practice. Control your body first and your speech. Why? Because they're driven by delusions and you're sick of suffering. Then you start to control your mind which is the delusions themselves. And you become the recipient of the benefit of this. Then you move into the compassion wing and realize we're all in the same boat. And you know, you continue to work on your mind, but now in benefit to others. Then you go to Tantra and you continue to work on your mind. You identify with the deity within you. You identify with that and you say mantra, you say your prayer, your practices every day, training yourself to become that Buddha. That's the essence of it. All of it is a method to help you become Buddha. But there's stages of development, stages of advance. And emptiness is the key. So let's talk about emptiness before we finish. But it is what drives it. But what makes this possible, what makes this reasonable is emptiness. In other words, if you've got a very fixed view about yourself, I am this, I am that, which is how we are anyway, then if you don't realize you've got the ability to change and that your nature is not intrinsic, you can't move an inch. So the idea of turning yourself into a green lady sounds like superstition. You should be locked up in a, a prison of mentally ill people. It just sounds like hilarious, doesn't it? becoming a green lady or a, a, a wrathful looking dude with 14 hands. It looks like hilarious, superstitious nonsense. So the difference there is the realization of emptiness. And what does that mean here? It means I do not have an intrinsic nature. It means I am not set in stone. It means I can, it, the implication of emptiness is I'm not set in stone and I can change. That even is good enough. That even is profound. I'm not, yes, I'm angry, but it doesn't define me. What we do is I'm angry and then we exaggerate it and we set it, we set ourselves in stone. She is bad, she is ugly, and we set it in stone. That's the opposite to emptiness. We start to apply dependent arising and emptiness, it loosens the grip. You know, you know, yes, anger is there, but you don't over exaggerate it and it doesn't define you. And then you get to the bodhisattva path and you start to grow the love that counteracts the anger. And then you get to the tantric path and you start identifying with these perfect idealized beings. And so by, and then because of karma, because every time you thought you have leaves imprints in your mind every time you think i am tara you're programming your mind to become tara and what enables you to become tara is because your mind is empty so they talk about buddha nature we all possess buddha nature all that means is every mind has the potential to turn into the mind of a buddha and why the final logic for why 
you can change your mind from deluded mind to virtuous mind to perfect mind is because your mind is empty of existing from its own side, empty of being intrinsic, empty of existing truly, empty of self-existence, empty of existing in and of itself. All these are synonyms because your mind has no intrinsic nature as this or that. Because of that, it can become a Buddha. That's the logic of Buddha nature. So it should be very encouraging to us. And we can see the suffering of I am bad, I am no good, I cannot do it, I am hopeless, this is no good. We can see the pain that causes us because it paralyzes us. And then look at the pain it causes when we see other people the same. Look at him, he's evil, it's bad, therefore this and therefore that. We go crazy completely. So by beginning to loosen the grip of this ego grasping, this instinctive primordial belief, I am this set in stone already with karma you're doing that and then when you're seeing your mind you're doing that and then you get to bodhicitta you're doing that and now you get to tantra and you're really doing that so you're priming your mind all the way through the stages of practice you know so because your mind is empty of intrinsic nature because your mind lacks inherent existence and another way to put that is because delusions are not intrinsic delusions are not at the core of our being this is the amazing thing buddha has found because delusions are adventitious because delusions are not intrinsic because delusions don't go all the way into the nature of who we are this is the thing to understand we get this in high school this is a liberation for us then we have confidence that we can by removing those delusions. First, you control the servants of the delusions. Then you control the delusions. Then you add virtue to the mix, which mitigates the delusions. And then you put, you know, the deity yoga into it and continue to realize emptiness. Then this is, these are the methods psychologically for becoming that Buddha very, very quickly, you know. I mean, it's very delicious. And the more as that with deity yoga that you identify, instead of I'm a creep and I'm no good, you think I am Tara. You know you're not stupid yet. You're not yet. You're not living in a fantasy land. But by identifying with that, you, en you, you enliven, you energize, you activate that potential. It's very logical, psychologically, I tell you. And it's utterly based in confidence. And that's what they mean by divine pride. I think it's the most beautiful saying, divine pride, divine pride. Be glad to identify that with that deity. Identify with that nature, your nature. Identify with it. This is who I can become. And by thinking about it and visualizing and absorbing the deity into you and imagining you out of emptiness, you become this deity. Because deity yoga is completely rooted in understanding emptiness. In Tantra, you see that when you do the simple deity yoga, we do little examples of this when I lead the meditations. It's very simple examples. What you do is you've done all the visualizations. Tara is out there. You visualize, you make offerings, you make requests, you do pr prostrations, and then you visualize Tara. And then you utilize, this is what Lama Zopa talks about this in his chapter in the death book, How to Face Death Without Fear. And the chapter is called Yoke, Death is What the Yogis Have Been Waiting For. But I'm going to read you from that, and that'll be the way to finish. It's very encouraging. Now I can't use my silly phone because I'm watching it, and I have to use my iPad. Sorry. Let me use my iPad, and I'll find this book of Rima Chase, and I'll read you his very delicious words, okay, as an ending. Find it first. There we go. Okay. I was asking me to buy it. That's ridiculous. I've got it in my book. How come it's not here? I might as well buy it. What the hell? Come on, you people. I'll read it to you. I've got it on my computer, but my computer's underneath my phone, which is underneath my little stand, which is underneath a box. So I could prop it up properly so I could see you all on my phone. Oh, this is taking too long. I can't do it. So let me see how else I can get it. I have to get my computer. So excuse me, people. I have to just do some wiggling around here. You can still see me. There we go. Here we go. We've got it in here. 
words, very encouraging words. Because you see, my T-Mobile is not working properly and it stopped doing my mobile data, so I can't do Zoom on my computer. It went wrong. Where's this book? Won't be long. Now my documents are gone. I don't understand this. Okay. Find it, Uncle. Sorry, can't find it. Your books are. There we go. Won't be long. Death. Okay, here we go. Death reprint. Here's the chapter. Okay, good. So listen. So just listen. Uh, generally, it's not permitted to openly give details of the methods that the great yogis use. However, I feel it would be useful to talk briefly about them here. Death is the moment they've been waiting for. At the point in the death process, when all the grosser consciousnesses have ceased, and that's what the death process is, gradual deconstruction from the gross to the subtle to the very subtle. Death is the moment, so at the point of the, when the, all the grosser consciousnesses have ceased and only the extremely subtle consciousness is left, as discussed in, so the yogis, those who've observed karma well, kept their precepts purely, spent their lives training their minds in the clear light meditation and have been able to recognize this clear light in this death process, which they've meditated on all their lives, the imagined, visualized one, are now able to recognize the clear light of death. They can remain in meditation in the clear light, conjoined with emptiness for as long as they wish. One hour, three days, many months. Some meditators stay in clear light meditation in their hermitage for years. There are many examples, so never mind that. So by concentrating in this subtlest state without distraction, some practitioners achieve enlightenment at that time. They actually, because in other words, the death process, because the mind is becoming subtler just naturally, then you, you because you practice all your life, you're able to go through that process without losing the plot. And you get to the very subtle mind, which is the subtlest, most capable level of your mind, like the microscope, like I said before, just naturally. And you're able to meditate at that level. That's the most potent level of your mind. They actually realize they become Buddha at that point. Many Tibetan lamas have passed away, and it's okay. Thinking that a person was, never mind that. So you too can transform death, intermediate state, and rebirth. The practices these yogis do are available to those who have taken a highest tantra initiation. That would be Kala Chakra, Vajrayogini, Heruka Chakra Sambara, Gyalwa Gyatso, Yamantaka, many of these. They are the quickest methods for achieving enlightenment in one brief lifetime of this degenerate time. By doing these practices, you can collect in just a few years the merit that would otherwise take you three countless great eons to collect on the Mahayana perfection vehicle path. This is one of the key factors about the tantric path. And it's a technical thing, you know. These practices have a very special arrangement. And this is and doing the sadhana, that's the term they use. I don't know what the technical meaning in Sanskrit is, but this is it's a constructed way you practice these deities, that you do the complete sadhana, not just simply generating yourself as the deity and reciting the mantra without the mandala, not like that. It's a very important preparation for death. You will understand this when you have received the commentaries on the generation stage and the completion stage practices. Whether you do the long version of the sadhana of the deity you are committed to do or the middle length version, they both contain the essence of the generation stage practice, transforming the three experiences of death, intermediate state and rebirth into the three bodies of a Buddha. We didn't go too much into this, but it's okay. Even so, by meditating in this way, you prepare your mind by purifying ordinary death, ordinary intermediate state, and ordinary rebirth, enabling you. So, in other words, the, once you go through the death process and you get to the very subtle mind, that's the way of purifying and becoming the Dharmakaya. 
And then you get re when you move into the intermediate state and you, you, your subtle mind manifests, you can then become the enjoyment body, the deity's body. And then when you become reborn, you're purifying and creating the cause to become the actual physical body that other people can see, the Nimanakaya. Thus planting the seeds to achieve these three bodies of the Buddha, the truth, the mind, the subtle body, and the gross one. When you just recite the words, there is, of course, a positive imprint left on your mind, but you're not strongly preparing your mind as you would if you to actually meditate. Sokan Sanchan Rinpoche used to emphasize very much that if you are busy and can't do much meditation in the deity sadhanas, when it comes to your daily commitments, you should do more elaborate meditations for your main deity. Because at some point you recognize when you do these practices, you recognize the one you have the closest connection with, and that becomes your, your own yidam. It sort of suits your character. It suits your nature. So how in all your sadhanas, you must do the three kayas meditation, this transformation of these stages. Even if it's not elaborate, even if you don't follow the extensive procedures, you should at least meditate on the last point, the four qualities of the foundation, having the divine pride thinking, this is the dharmakaya, this is me. And then on the day you die, because you have trained your mind by doing your sadhanas every day, you are able to recognize what's happening. The 25 stages of dissolution without missing any, just as you had meditated. Because your mind is well trained, you are able to recognize the clear light. And during the intermediate state and at the time of birth as well, you'll be able to meditate, to visualize the deity. So this is real, in other words, this is technical, highly sophisticated technology that one needs to learn. And these are methods for becoming a Buddha very quickly, using death as a quick path to enlightenment. So practicing the highest tantra path like this, using death as a quick path to enlightenment is incredible. It is the quickest way to purify the delusions, the dualistic view. In other words, having prepared during the generation stage on the basis of that realization, you then actualize the path time dharmakaya, the path time sambhogakaya, and the nimmanakaya on finally on the completion stage, actually ceasing the intellectually acquired defilements and the simultaneously born defilements. Eventually, you cut even the subtle defilements, the dualistic view. And in that moment, achieve the result time three bodies, enlightenment. This is how you can enjoy death by using the tantric path, the quickest way to achieve enlightenment. So that's to inspire you to, if you haven't taken a highest yoga empowerment, that will inspire you to take one when you're ready, when you've got the three principal aspects of the path in your heart and you have this wish to take these practices and to have faith in the practices, faith in the guru, and just follow the explanations as well as you can step by baby step, okay? So I've got a feeling that's enough. Just a taste. I'm sorry. I hope I said something useful. All right, people. So uh, I said we should read the three principal aspects of the path. I think we'll do that. Okay. Now I'll read it. It's a good exercise. The three principal aspects of the path by Lama Tsongkhapa. I shall ex and meditate on these words. Just do your best. I shall explain here to the best of my ability the essential points of all the scriptures of the conqueror. The path acclaimed by all excellent bodhisattvas, the gateway for the fortunate ones aspiring for liberation. Those who are not attached to the joys of psychic existence, who strive to make meaningful, I've got to get my picture out of the way here, who strive to make meaningful this life of leisure and opportunity, who, and who place their trust in the path that pleases the conquerors. O oh, fortunate ones, listen with an open heart. Without pure renunciation, there is no means to pacify the yearning for the joys and fruits of samsaric ocean. And as craving for existence chains us thoroughly, at first search for a true renunciation. By cultivating in mind that this human life is so hard to find, yet has no time to spare, Preoccupations with this life will cease. 
by contemplating repeatedly the truth of karma and samsaric suffering, preoccupations with next life will come to cease. As you habituate in this way, and when not even an instant of admiration arises for the prosperities of psychic existence, and when the thought aspiring for liberation arises day and night, at this point, true renunciation has risen. So we can see from that we have a way to go. That's just renunciation, folks. Okay. Now, such renunciation, too, if it is not sustained by pure awakening mind, which is bodhicitta, it will not become a cause of the perfect bliss of unexcelled enlightenment. Therefore, intelligent ones generate the excellent bodhicitta. They're, they're being swept away constantly by four powerful rivers. They are bound tightly with fetters of karma, most difficult to escape. They're trapped inside the iron mesh of self-grasping. They're in, enveloped from everywhere by thick mists of ignorance. They take birth within psychic existence that has no end. When they're endlessly tormented by the three sufferings, by reflecting on all your mothers who suffer such conditions, please generate the supreme bodhicitta. You see, this is the point. If you can't have renunciation of your own suffering, it is absolutely impossible to have compassion for others' suffering, which is why renunciation comes first. If you do not have the wisdom realizing the ultimate nature, even if you gain familiarity with renunciation and bodhicitta, you will not be able to cut the root of samsaric existence. So strive in the means of realizing dependent arising. When with respect to all phenomena of samsara and nirvana, you see that cause and effects never deceive their laws. And when you have dismantled the focus of objectification, at that point, you have entered the path that pleases the Buddhas. So long as the two understandings of appearance, which is undeceiving dependent arising, and emptiness devoid of all of these, remain separate. So when appearances, which is dependent arising, and emptiness these two, when they remain separate, as long as you have not realized this, that they're not separate, you haven't realized the intent of the sage. However, at some point, when without alternation, but at once, the instant you see that dependent arising is undeceiving, if the entire object of grasping at certitude is dismantled, at that point, your analysis of the view is complete. You've realized emptiness. Furthermore, when appearance dispels the extreme of existence, and when emptiness dispels the extreme of non-existence, and if you understand how emptiness arises as cause and effect, you will never be captivated by views grasping at extremes. Thus, so you can say that's the dualistic mind. We've got two extremes right now. We see everything as concrete, or when we hear about emptiness, we think it is nihilistic. We've got this, this is the literal dualism, you know. I can't see it. Go, go down again, Mary, please. Go down again, darling. My picture's in the way. So thus, again, I'll read it. Thus, when you have understood as they are the essentials of the three principal aspects of the path, renunciation, bodhicitta, and emptiness then oh, oh son or daughter of the of, of you know seek solitude and by enhancing the power of perseverance swiftly accomplish your ultimate aspiration so these three these three qualifiers and i said so to repeat and to finish so a semblance having a semblance of genuine confidence and to some degree, some understanding of this renunciation, that you're sick of suffering, that you're exhausted by suffering, and that you know that your karma and your delusions cause it, and you want to get rid of it. And a semblance of understanding of this outrageous, unbelievable body cheater that everybody else is in the same boat. And finally, that nothing has an intrinsic nature. 
When these three, you've got a semblance of realizing these three, understanding these three, then you're ready to take an empowerment. Jang chob sem chog rim poche, ma kye panam ke gyu chi, kye panam pa me pa yang, gong ne gong du pa ba shok, ge wa di nyu do dag, lama sang ge drup gyo ne, dro wa chik yang ma lu pa de yi sala, ge pa shok. And maybe never develop, even for a moment, wrong views towards our most precious gurus when with faith and respect gained from seeing their goodness may their full inspiration flow into our hearts okay everyone thank you dearest people i mean maybe i cut earlier i think it's okay we've had enough i think i don't see your faces i can't see only my silly self i can't see any of you people don't know what happened here we go everybody's there caroline thank you and alona and, uh, and there's, I can't see everybody's name. Charles is there. Chris is there. David put Dundrup's there. Venerable Dundrup, thank you. Mary Jane and Charlene is there. And Don is there. And and Erin is there. And Victoria and Mikael, Jane, Linda, everybody. I can't, there's Dawn, Anna, John, all of you people. I'm so happy to see you all. So happy. And even if 1% made sense, please keep practicing and never give up, okay? Thank you, darling people, so much. So grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me, everybody. Much love.